Hi, I'm Jim Papakoukas of AEI, and I'll be moderating today's event, Convergent or Divergent, discussing President Biden's first much, much of the focus this morning will be on two new proposals from the Biden administration, the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan. These bills, if passed, would have wide-ranging effects on many issues, including tax policy, infrastructure, energy policy, and our social safety net. And that raises many questions. How much will raising taxes affect economic growth in the United States? How can policymakers most effectively revamp this country's infrastructure? Can we provide greater assistance to families without discouraging work? And will this administration continue to rely more on the executive branch for pol policymaking, or will Congress begin to reassert itself? I'm excited to discuss these questions and many more, I'm sure, with today's panel of AEI scholars, whom I will now introduce. Richard Geddes focuses on infrastructure, public and private partnerships, the U.S. postal system, and corporate governance. He's also the director of the Cornell Program in Infrastructure Policy. Kyle Parmalou studies federal tax policy. Previously, Kyle was the chief economist and vice president of economic analysis at the Tax Foundation. Philip Wallach studies America's separation of powers with a focus on regulatory policy issues and the relationship between Congress and the administrative state. Uh, before joining AI, Phil was a senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution and the R Street Institute. And Scott Winship is the director of poverty studies here at AI, where he researches social mobility and the causes and effects of poverty. Previously, he served as the executive director of the Joint Economic Committee, where he spearheaded the social capital project. Uh, a couple more things before we begin. First, we're doing a Q&A uh, at the end of this event probably around 10 o'clock or so. So please submit your questions on Twitter with the hashtag AEI Biden's 100 day. That's AEI Biden's 100 days. You can also submit a question via email by contacting the email address listed in the event description. And finally, please stick around. Once our discussion is over, there'll be a second AEI panel discussing the foreign policy of President Biden's first 100 days, and that'll begin about 1035 or so Eastern time. Uh, so uh, I think with that, we'll get started uh, with, uh, with Rick, who I think we'll be talking a bit about infrastructure. Rick? Yeah, yeah. thanks, James. James. And, and thanks for the invitation to uh, come and speak. Uh, it's terrific to be invited, and it's obviously a very important topic, uh, one of the most uh, bipartisan topics, I think. Uh, so I'll take a, a quick step back, try to summarize the issues in a short amount of time. First, by defining uh, infrastructure, there's been some issues on the question of definitions recently. And normally we think about it in two buckets. One is what we think of as heavy civil or networked infrastructure. So this is what most people think of when they the word infrastructure comes up. They probably think of large systems uh, with strong physical interconnections between component parts, like a drinking water system or a wastewater treatment system, a transportation system or an energy system, now perhaps also a, a communication system. Uh, the second bucket we call social infrastructure, it's still physical infrastructure. So if all of this is physical, in the sense, uh, social infrastructure would be standalone facilities, like a school, a prison, a courthouse, a hospital, that might provide sort of public goods and services, be publicly owned, uh, but is still part of the, the infrastructure system. In, uh, in the United States, a lot of these systems are old, particularly in the eastern part of the United States, um, but they are, um, you know, uh, very much in need of renovation. So one of the, the big issues, I think, is um, shifting the focus from uh, uh, building out old systems, so, so designing and constructing, or sorry, uh, building out new systems, designing and constructing the interstate, to doing better operation and maintenance of the systems that we have, already better taking care of uh, the systems that we have. And so that's one policy thrust that I think we need to keep in mind. Um, the second thing to keep in mind is that over 90% of what we consider to be civil infrastructure is owned by a state or local government. So it's normally not federally owned. Federally owned infrastructure is often uh, military infrastructures like army bases and Navy bases. Normal civil infrastructure is state and locally owned. So that means that state and local, you have to figure out how the federal government is going to work with state and local governments in order to improve that infrastructure. So normally that would be uh, operation and maintenance. So one of the big issues that I think where there's, there's confusion, James, about this is the distinction between funding versus financing. 
We often hear that there's a financing gap in taking care of our infrastructure, but really what it is is, is a funding gap. And that means we've had deferred maintenance uh, for many years for a lot of systems. Um, due to political uh, incentives, there's an incentive to build new systems and not take care of, of what we have. The American Society of Civil Engineers estimates that at almost a trillion dollars uh, backlog of deferred maintenance. So as we try to, you know, take care of these um, these systems, you know, we have to focus on shifting from design and construction uh, to operation and maintenance and really coming up with the money for that. So when we think about that, uh, James, the uh, there's different ways of doing it. One big issue is user fees. So instead of using general taxes uh, to fund infrastructure, to pay for it, is using more of a, of a user fee. In transportation, the gas tax and the diesel tax historically has been in the nature of a user fee. Um, there's a lot of states that are pushing towards mileage-based user fees. To get away from a per gallon tax on gas or diesel fuel and to focus more on um, charging some sort of per mile uh, road usage fee. Um, so that's a funding issue. So uh, the other, other issues that come up with regard to uh, transportation infrastructure are, um, and infrastructure in general is environmental permitting. So speeding up the environmental permitting process, uh, making that uh, work better. And it's one of the things that you said, James, is um, bringing more private investment into uh, working, the public and the private sector working together uh, to better take care of infrastructure. Um, th that can occur in a lot of ways. I think the way that infrastructure is procured or delivered in the United States needs to be updated. Uh, the way we've delivered it over time, which uh, is called traditional delivery, which would take me longer to explain, has resulted in a situation where there's a lot of deferred maintenance. So uh, one of the issues is to just bundle together more activities like bundled design and construction together with operation and maintenance of infrastructure, and then um, have a long-term contract that'll ensure that the, the infrastructure is better maintained than it has been in the past. So there, I think there's a whole lot of uh, margins on which the um, two parties can collaborate on a good infrastructure bill. I'll just close, James, by saying that the, um, you know, this, this is really a, a bipartisan issue. And this is, is one of the things where I think both parties can uh, cooperate. But I'll close by saying that Congress doesn't pass an infrastructure bill. It passes a bill focused on transportation, another bill focused on water, another bill focused on energy, and now perhaps one focused on communications and broadband. So Congress is going to, there's going to be a whole bunch of committees that are going to have to collaborate and coordinate in order to get various types of infrastructure bills uh, passed. So I'll stop there and look forward to questions. I think James is on mute. Oh, I'm a bad moderator. Uh, we're up for uh, a Kyle, who I think will be talking about taxes next. Looks like we've got a lot of changes perhaps coming up over the next uh, year or so. So, uh, Kyle. Yeah, th thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah, so first we started with infrastructure. Now we'll talk about how the Biden administration wants to finance some of this new spending. So par part of the American Jobs Plan that was released earlier this month, uh, Joe Biden, his administration put forth pretty significant changes to the corporate income tax as a means uh, to pay for a lot of the new spending. Um, so just a brief overview of what all the provisions are. So I think the, the biggest one that a lot of people paid attention to is they will first raise the corporate income tax rate currently at 21% to 28%. Um, in addition, he would reform the minimum tax on foreign profits that U.S. multinational corporations uh, uh, earn overseas, um, and he'll change this a number a number of ways. Some of the changes are pretty complex, complicated. Um, in addition, he would eliminate um, and a, uh, a provision called FDII or foreign derived intangible income. Uh, this is a provision that allows corporations to deduct uh, a portion of their income that they earn in the United States related to exports. 
He would replace a current minimum tax called the BEAT or the Base Erosion Anti-Abuse Tax with another minimum tax that has an acronym called SHIELD, which they call Stopping Harmful Inversions and Ending Low-Tax Developments. Um, these work kind of similar, but the SHIELD is supposed to be a more powerful provision that denies deductions um, that corporations may take for payments they make to uh, other uh, related foreign corporations to prevent uh, profit shifting and base erosion. Um, he, at the same time, because all of these, uh, many of these provisions would raise the burden on corporations located in the United States, he, his, his policy would make it more difficult for corporations to expatriate or to invert and move their headquarters overseas. At the same time, he would enact a 15% minimum book tax. So corporations in each year would have to pay the greater of 15% of their financial statement income or their ordinary corporate, uh, corporate tax liability. He would eliminate fossil fuel provisions. Um, these are aimed at raising taxes on oil and natural gas companies. Uh, we don't really know exactly what these provisions are yet, um, but based on, the, on past, maybe things like eliminating last in first out accounting for uh, fossil fuel companies, eliminating some regulations um, related to the foreign tax credit for oil companies, um, but still not a lot of details. And then lastly, he would increase auditing um, for corporations as a means to raise revenue. Um, and one of the big goals of Biden administration has been to reduce the tax gap. And they think they can pick up some additional revenue from increasing audit rates among corporations. Overall, these provisions will probably raise somewhere between 130 to $150 billion a year in additional revenue, or about a half a percentage point of GDP um, in, in additional revenue each and every year. Uh, and the administration says this ends up paying for the American jobs, jobs plan over a 15-year period. Um, now, there's a little bit of a budget window game here going on. A lot of the spending in the American jobs plan is, is large and temporary, so it comes in at the first 10 years, but the taxes are permanent. So what you really see is that there's borrowing up front because the taxes are insufficient to pay for the large spending up front, but then in outside the budget window, because the taxes are, are permanent, it ends up raising revenue on net and reducing the deficit in the long term, in the long run. Now, that said, I think that the policies out there in terms of revenue are more of a ceiling. It's probably the most you'd expect the federal government to raise from corporations, because I think what's going to limit this is the politics of the, of the proposal and some of the complexities. There are already concerns about some of the policies out there. For example, the corporate tax rate was more likely we're going to see something like 25% rather than 28%. And that by itself knocks about $30 billion off the total uh, revenue from the, from the corporations. Um, and just to, like, just to conclude here for some final thoughts about the proposal, first, I want to, you know, I want to give them credit for wanting to finance their new spending. Um, this, you know, Sometimes this is rare, um, and but I think you know they've chosen to raise revenue from maybe a, a pretty inefficient source, um, the corporate income tax. There are downsides to raising the corporate tax and you know, raising the 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 tax rate uh, to twenty eight percent. That increases the incentive to shift profits out of the United States makes the cost of investment higher, can reduce the capital stock in the long run. The international provisions are pretty significant change from current law. I didn't really get into the details, but there are some complexities in there that the administration hasn't really worked through yet. Um, and I think there may be some political challenges there too. Um, the, the minimum tax on book income, I mean, one, it's poor policy, it's complicated. Um, it's also probably not gonna raise very much revenue at the end of the day. The administration is already paring it back. Uh, but that's something that's probably should be dropped and maybe dropped at the end here. Um, and uh, give the administration some credit. Again, I think they recognize some of these downsides to the policy. That's why they're looking for provisions such as shield. Um, they, they know that there's going to be this pressure for companies to move profits or headquarters overseas. So they also want to work with foreign, uh, foreign jurisdictions on their policies. They could, to stop what they call the race to the bottom, 
um, to bring taxes up on corporations throughout the world. Um, somewhat skeptical they'd be able to do that. Um, there's already been some pushback from some countries that have uh, tax rates that are lower than this minimum tax that they're looking to, pr to propose. Um, and then the, the last piece here is it's also important to point out what their corporate policy doesn't uh, doesn't address. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act left a lot of policies that are scheduled to change, tax increases that are scheduled to go into effect. The treatment of research and development expenses is going to worsen um, at the end of this year. The following year, um, 100% bonus depreciation is going to start phasing out. These are tax increases that are going to reduce the incentive to invest in the United States. Um, I think that's something that Biden administration lawmakers should at least consider um, addressing as part of their package. It may actually help also offset some of the down downsides, the economic downsides of their proposals. So to conclude, you know, I think it's good they're aiming to finance their spending. I don't think the corporate code is uh, um, is the best way to do it. Um, even though I think that you know, the corporate income tax does need uh, does need changes here, um, but you know, overall, I think um, you know, not everything's fi fixed um, fixed yet, and I think there are still some changes that will occur. Um, but you know, you know we'll, we'll see what happens. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Kyle. That was super informative. Now we're, I think we're up with uh, Phil, who I think is going to be uh, talking a bit about uh, government governance, I think. Uh, Phil? Well, uh, I've, I was asked to talk about two things, the separation of powers um, and sort of how the branches are working together in, in fashioning domestic policy and regulatory policy specifically. So those are two areas that I study that are often very much related in that oftentimes in recent years, the big question in making new regulations is just how much the executive branch can change without having to depend on Congress. Uh, so to give one consequential example, take climate change. Uh, so ever since the Waxman-Markey climate change bill failed in the Democratic controlled Senate back in 2010, the question has been how far existing statutes can go to control greenhouse gas emissions, and especially the Clean Air Act. Every step along the way has caused a legal firestorm, whether it's a step forward or more regulation or a step back, trying to peel those regulations back in the Trump administration. At every step, the courts are asked to, to weigh in. And so it, these fights really drag out. And it's really not an exaggeration at all to say that the Trump administration spent its whole four years trying to unwind Obama administration climate rules uh, with varying degrees of success. So the Biden administration is not picking up exactly where the Obama administration left off. Instead, it finds itself starting over to some degree, and it brings an even higher level of ambition, as articulated in President Biden's recent pledge to cut United States greenhouse emissions to half their 2005 levels by 2030. Some of the necessary steps to fulfill that goal are proposed in the administration's infrastructure bill that we've already heard about. But a lot of it will be pursued through executive branch initiatives that try to survive congressional and judicial scrutiny once they've been put in place, rather than getting approval up front. If we zoom out to regulatory policy more generally, President Biden has signaled a determination to transform regulatory policymaking and the cost-benefit analyses that are a central part of it by focusing more on, in the words of a presidential memorandum that calls for modernization of the regulatory process, quote, social welfare, racial justice, environmental stewardship, human dignity, equity, and the interests of future generations, end quote. Uh, while we don't know exactly how any of that will work in practice, uh, those sound like very big changes, representing a definitive end to an era where regulatory policymakers at least aspired to present their decisions as based on sound apolitical economics. That consensus, like so many others in American political life today, has dissolved. Uh, but the Senate is composed of 50 Democrats and 50 Republicans. Um, in, those 50 Democrats include uh, Emperor Joe Manchin of West Virginia, uh, who is not always eager to support more stringent regulations on fossil fuels. Uh, because of his constituency. 
So the question is once again, how much Biden's cabinet agencies can push through without the help of Congress? You hear a lot about tackling climate change with green jobs, spending programs of various sorts. And that's certainly what President Biden emphasized in his uh, address to Congress last night. That's in part because we're very much into spending these days. Um, and it's in part because it's, it's more plausible to project a path through the Senate for a spending bill uh, than a new regulatory law, in, in large part because of the budget reconciliation rules that allow uh, the majority party to move a tax and spending bill uh, with, with just 50 votes. And it remains to be seen whether that, uh, whether that provision is used again as, as it already was um, for the Recovery Act passed in March. So Congress could decide to involve itself anytime it wants. It, it has certainly the constitutional authority to, to dominate regulatory policy making. It hasn't been completely absent in recent years. Uh, in 2016, Congress worked out an overhaul of our toxic substances law, and it passed a statute governing the label of genetically modified foods, uh, an imp important statute that most people have never noticed. But there was really very little um, statute making in the regulatory arena during the Trump administration. Instead, you see Congress become a peanut gallery. Uh, its members cheering on the moves that the executive branch officials make or the counter moves that advocacy groups make in court. Um, and, you know, from a, from a first principles constitutional uh, foundations point of view, that's, that's really unfortunate. Um, we like to think that the political process ought to be setting the agenda, ought to be making the big decisions about, about the shape of our regulatory state. But in recent years, that's just not how it's been going. And it's really been uh, a bad bet to imagine that Congress is going to reassert itself in this in this arena, you know, as in others. Uh, I'm sure the, the foreign policy panel this afternoon may talk about, um, you know, Congress re reasserting its war making uh, power to decide uh, the limits of America's conflicts ab abroad. Uh, but really, there's been a lot more talk about the possibilities of that than action realizing that. And that's certainly the case in the regulatory arena as well. Um, I, think, uh, I think I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Phil. And also, thank you for hyping the uh, Foreign Policy and Defense Panel again, which will be following this one at about 10.35. Uh, you got to catch that one. Uh, next up uh, is Scott, who's going to talk a bit about family policy, I think. Uh, that's right. Uh, thanks a lot, Jim. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> so in family policy, uh, this has been a place where I think there's been a lot of loose talk uh, about the Biden pres presidency being transformative. Um, and I, I think it's important at the outset to kind of keep some perspective. Um, what the administration has passed so far was the fourth or fifth of a series of emergency COVID-related uh, bills, very large bills, um, <clears throat> most of the uh, uh, provisions of which were temporary. Um, that said, uh, Biden certainly has uh, great aspirations embedded in uh, the American Jobs Plan and American Families Plan, uh, which he's recently introduced. If those pass, then uh, it will be time to, to speak of President Biden as a, as a president along the lines of an LBJ uh, or an FDR. Um, but that certainly remains to be seen. Um, nevertheless, I think uh, that he, there are some real uh, uh, winds that are shifting in, in terms of family policy, and Republican policymakers are increasingly being uh, sort of blown along with those winds. Uh, so I think it's important to take a look uh, at, at, at the way things are, are trending uh, in this area. The first uh, trend I think I'd want to point out is uh, there's this pervasive view that it's money that matters and that nobody has enough money. Um, that is a view that, that probably was justifiable last April when the unemployment rate uh, was flirting with 20%. It was certainly less justifiable once we uh, got confirmation uh, later in the year that the savings rate was higher than it had been in 50 years. Um, and it was certainly less true when President Biden took office uh, when there was good data out there from uh, the Center for po uh, on Poverty and Social Policy at Columbia University that suggested that poverty 
in January uh, was was at an all-time low. It was actually comparable uh, and a little bit lower than what it had been before the pandemic. Yet we still uh, uh, passed uh, a $1.9 trillion uh, uh, bill on top of that um, that was heavily focused on cash transfers. Um, so about $900 billion uh, in the American Rescue Plan uh, consisted of transfers to households. Um, that was about half the cost. You know, compare that to the bills that were passed in 2020, about 30% of which were, were transfers to households. Those included everything from you know the $1,400 checks that we gave to even married couples making as much as $150,000, $1,400 per person. Um, those included the unemployment insurance expansions uh, that were extended, uh, the $300 top-offs uh, that were included. Um, those included the, the child tax credit uh, expansion um, uh, that was uh, to the tune of $110 billion. Um, so uh, at least uh, at least one one point two to one point four trillion of the American Families Plan uh, that President Biden has, has just proposed, um, one point two to one point four out of one point eight uh, consists of household transfers, um, and that's on top of all of these all of these things. Um, there's been uh, oh, and I should say too, the Amer even the American Jobs Plan, which is in theory an infrastructure bill, um, includes four hundred billion dollars for Childcare infrastructure, which, or I'm sorry, not uh, for for sort of caregiving infrastructure, um, to use the euphemism. As far as I can tell, that's just an expansion of Medicaid, uh, an expansion of Medicaid benefits for long-term care uh, and a home and community-based care. Um, Four hundred billion dollars. So there's been less of a focus throughout on uh, on opportunity as as being important for family policy. Um, uh, we see that in the continued focus on 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 cash transfers when really what we probably ought to have been focused on at some point uh, is getting kids back in school, dealing with these learning gaps that have, that have opened up over the last year, thinking about uh, remedial stuff for 2020. Um, the UK is, is doing a national tutoring program. There's a number of things that we could have tried to do that were not simply cash transfers, um, but we have not been focused on those for various reasons. Um, to be fair, uh, the Biden administration has proposed uh, money for things like universal pre-K for three and four-year-olds. Um, universal community college. Uh, even there, though, they don't seem uh, all that uh, concerned about how the money is spent. It's more just about spending as much money uh, as we can. Um, and then, of course, there is there's this kind of focus on inequality and who has more money uh, than than who. Um, and we see that in all the rhetoric around the taxes, um, uh, with corporations and rich people having to pay their fair share, um, even though. Uh, uh, Taxes are, are quite progressive in the United States versus other countries already. Um, let's say a, a couple other things. Um, there's also been a focus on universalism, I would say, or near universalism. So uh, the child allowance, for instance, um, uh, was expanded to folks well up into the income distribution um, rather than being sort of something that was more targeted on, on folks uh, that, that could use it, um, that could use it more. Uh, we see calls for universal paid leave to the tune of $225 billion. There's the universal pre-K, that's $200 billion over 10 years. Um, community college, the direct payments, the 1,400 checks weren't universal, but uh, but, uh, but went to a lot more people than, than probably needed them um, to the tune of $400 billion um, in the American Rescue Plan. Um, a third uh, area I would highlight is that there's been a disregard of deficits. Um, Essentially, in 2020, we deficit financed four trillion dollars in spending over and above what we uh, normally would have done. Um, in June of 2019, uh, the Congressional <laughs> Budget Office projected that uh, debt held by the public uh, would be 113 percent of GDP at the end of 2039 and 144 percent of GDP at the end of 2049. Uh, by March of 2021, this was before the passage of the American Rescue Plan. Uh, it projected that by 2041, uh, that figure would be 145% rather than the 113% it had projected the, by the end of 2039, uh, just a year earlier. Um, and at the end of 2051, it's projecting a debt of 202% of GDP, uh, which would be unprecedented. Um, and again, that's before the American Rescue Plan, which will add uh, $1.8 to deficits uh, just over the next 10 years. Um, the American Jobs Plan is is more than paid for by the tax cuts um, or the the tax increases that they've included, uh, but the American Families Plan would add another three hundred billion dollars uh, to deficits as well. Um, 
finally, I would say uh, there's there's sort of a disregard for unintended consequences. Um, this is, has shown up in the debate over child allowances, um, which I've been a part of, um, with little concern about uh, whether more generosity uh, without, uh, without work requirements attached to it would increase the number of people who choose not to work, would increase single parenthood. It's shown up in the unemployment insurance um, policies for sure, um, where there's been little regard to whether topping off incomes by $600 in 2020 and now $300 um, uh, this year uh, would have an impact on, on labor supply uh, and on economic growth. It's shown up in disregard about uh, the potential for inflation if we're, uh, if we're spending more uh, uh, than we than is actually warranted um, given economic conditions, um, which could end up just driving up prices. Um, and it's shown up in, in sort of the disregard for whether some of the taxes that we're talking about, doubling the capital gains tax, for instance, uh, the top capital gains tax rate uh, will have unintended consequences as well. Now, it's easy to, to criticize Democrats and the Biden administration for some of this stuff, but I would argue that uh, the Republicans um, uh, increasingly are being carried along uh, by some of these wins as well. Um, and I, I think that's something that we need to be careful about uh, in the short term and the long term uh, to not forget uh, the principles um, that were guiding us before uh, we had a once uh, in a century uh, public health crisis. Um, and, and we've sort of got to shake that off as the economy returns to normal and the public health situation improves and uh, and, and start forcefully arguing um, for the principles that we were advocating before. Great, Scott. That was uh, that was fantastic. And before we have a uh, go to a brief discussion, I want to remind everybody watching that we'll be doing a Q&A at the end of sort of this discussion period. Uh, so please submit your questions on Twitter with the hashtag AEI Biden's 100 days. And of course, you can also use email by using the email address in the event uh, description. So I just want to start off with a uh, kind of a general question. Um, the uh, the Trump administration uh, was a, in many ways was a very unsurprising administration. Uh, many of his campaign promises, he then went and kind of did them or tried to do them. Uh, he said he wanted to cut taxes. We had some big tax cuts. He said he wanted to build a wall. Let's start building a wall. He said, well, you know, I'm, there might be a trade war. I might raise tariffs. And there was certainly a lot of trade wars and a, a lot of tariffs. So at, a, at sort of this 100 day mark, and what, let's just go, we can just, I'm just going to go kind of around in the, in the order in which y'all spoke. What have been sort of the surprises that you've seen so far, either in what the Biden administration has done or, uh, or what it's proposing to do? Again, we'll start with uh, Rick. Yeah, so, so thanks, James. I think in my uh, area you know, of infrastructure, it's kind of interesting that uh, President Trump stressed infrastructure a lot uh, during the campaign, but there, you know, there, was, there was not an initiative um, you know, that, that made it uh, sort of into serious discussion you know, in Congress, uh, even though you know, typically a bipartisan uh, thing. But uh, President Biden has you know, stressed that greatly in his, in his first uh, 100 days. And I think he really does want to get some sort of a bipartisan uh, transportation bill, perhaps a energy bill, perhaps uh, communications uh, broadband uh, bill passed. He's reached out, you know, to, to the other uh, parts uh, of the aisle. I think the surprising thing in, in my world is how the uh, notion of infrastructure, where there's been pretty much consensus in the civil infrastructure world, it's roads, bridges, seaports, airports. Uh, drinking water systems, wastewater systems, and some of the social infrastructure I missed, um, mentioned before was conflated uh, with uh, social program spending. So normally, you know, infrastructure is investment. Its investment could be made by private companies in the uh, form of freight rail, uh, you know, the, the trains and, and signals for freight rail, private investment. But often we think about public investment, so in water systems. But a lot of that um, the, the social spending that I think is mislabeled as infrastructure, you know, is, is really current, uh, current spending. And I think it's unfortunate because it tends to dilute, you know, what I think the United States is bipartisan agreement. We have problems with infrastructure delivery. It tends to dilute that policy discussion, James. And I would like to see, you know, more of a clear focus on what has traditionally been considered to be, to be civil infrastructure uh, in the United States. So that's one surprising thing. I hope the discussion gets a little more focused as Congress actually passes bills uh, that deal with individual sectors. And um, we kind of get away from this notion that anything is infrastructure. 
So that was kind of the, one of the surprising things for me, James. Uh, Kyle, uh, anything, uh, anything jump out at you that you weren't quite looking for? In terms of tax policy, uh, Biden has been remarkably lined with his uh, with his campaign proposals. Uh, during the campaign, he put forth you know around three to four trillion dollars in tax increases, focused on raising revenue from the top one percent, large multinational corporations, and that's what he's he's proposed so far. Uh, maybe what might be somewhat surprising and is what is excluded from these tax proposals um, at this point. Hey, there's been a lot of, there's a lot of talk of, uh, during the campaign of scaling back the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act for high income households. Some of the provisions that he talked about getting rid of, such as the deduction for pass-through businesses, section 199 cap A, hasn't mentioned that yet, that hasn't been included. Another provision that is somewhat surprising that's been left out um, is the estate tax. During the campaign, he proposed bringing the estate tax back to 2009 parameters. That's been left out as well. Um, but you know, overall, I'd say that things are things are lining up um, quite well with what he promised during the campaign. Now that said, it. Still early. Um, they ha they haven't put out Treasury's Green Book yet. We don't know this, the entire suite of tax policies that the administration is going to put forth, and maybe some of those missing components will be there. Um, so we'll we'll see. Always time for more tax hikes, Kyle. Always time for more tax hikes. Uh, <laughs> uh, Phil, what what have you seen so far that uh, maybe you didn't uh, didn't expect to see? Well, jumped out I, think, another one. I think it depends on sort of, there's a lot, there's some different conceptions of, of President Biden out there. I think because of who he was running against in the 2020 Democratic primaries, I think for a little while there was sort of a sense that Biden was some kind of centrist, um, you know, and maybe that's true compared to Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. Um, but he really hasn't been governing as a centrist or, or reaching out across the aisle as somebody who seems to put a high premium on bipartisanship so far. Um, and I know some people may be surprised by that, others may not. I mean, before, before Joe Biden ever became vice president, he was, he was known as a sort of straight down the line partisan Democrat who's willing to make deals when, when they're out there. Uh, but, but definitely, uh, a, a, a real partisan, but I, I think, I think he's definitely uh, been been trying to satisfy his progressive base uh, in these first 100 days to try to show them some wins. Um, you know, some of which through executive action, some some um, some student loan forgiveness that he's undertaken. Um, so you know, some climate actions for sure, um, reversing a lot of Trump administration ex executive orders. Um, so I think there's been a lot of that um, base, base service sort of in the first 100 days. And I, I think the question is whether there's sort of a next phase where he actually thinks about, well, what can I actually get 60 votes for in the Senate? Or do we keep just trying to think about what we can sneak through with reconciliation uh, with, with 50? And, and I think that sort of remains to be seen. But a lot of the most ambitious things that this administration is talking about uh, will really have a hard time moving unless the president can get some Republicans on board. Great. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Scott, what surprised you? Well, I think uh, just as Kyle said, I mean, in some ways, what's surprising is, is how uh, how much fidelity there's been to uh, what he was talking about doing on the campaign trail. Normally, you uh, president gets pulled or a presidential candidate gets pulled to his uh, to his extreme uh, by his party during the primaries, has to kind of tack to the center. Um, and if you, uh, he or she is lucky enough to become president, um, then there's no way that you can you can advance all of the promises that you made um, during the campaign. And it's certainly true that President Biden has not been able to uh, propose all of them, but. Uh, to a surprising extent, um, he has been willing uh, to take this agenda, which you know, in the as recently as the 2012 presidential election, would have would have been uh, off the charts in terms of how ambitious and expensive it was. Um, 
uh, but to actually like uh, try to try to move it forward. Um, I think there's only a couple of areas, you know, where where he's had to, to compromise a little bit. Um, he had proposed lowering the Medicare eligibility age, I think, and that seems to have fallen by the wayside so far. Um, there were there was talk of trying to use the federal government's purchasing power to reduce um, prescription drug prices, and that uh, has also not not gone anywhere. He's disappointed some on the left by um, only uh, proposing to extend um, this this big child tax credit expansion uh, through 2025 um, with a with a smaller uh, permanent uh, extension of uh, of generosity uh, towards towards the bottom end. Um, but it's clear that you know he would he would like to extend that permanently uh, as well. Um, but I, I think the big surprise is the extent to which he's been willing. Um, to put forth a very expensive um, and ambitious agenda, despite having you know an incredibly narrow margin um, in the Senate. All right, uh, great, thanks a lot, Scott. Um, let's ask a couple questions. I want to. I actually want to start with uh, uh, Rick. Um, this is a very fundamental uh, question. You're going to want to unmute. Uh, how we're, we're spending? A, we want to spend a lot on infrastructure. That seems almost you know, either way that maybe, maybe the amount the uh, president wants to spend will go down a bit, but do we know really how much we need to spend to upgrade our infrastructure or to fix our infrastructure, whatever that means? Are the numbers he's talking about and the areas he's talking about, which everything from roads and highways to, to, to broadband, does that sound about right to you, the scope or, or, or do we really have a good idea? Yeah, so that's that's a great question, James, and, and it's a question about you know what what is the spending on. So as I said in my opening remarks, there's wide agreement that uh, the United States suffers from deferred maintenance in in a number of infrastructure categories. So it's always important to think about it, you know, as a sector, and that that includes uh, transportation infrastructure, so roads, bridges, tunnels, uh, highways, as well, you know. Uh, dams, levees, water infrastructure, drinking water, wastewater treatment. And there's a standard that civil engineers use called a state of good repair. And that actually is, has a rigorous meaning in you know at each infrastructure sector. What does a state of good repair mean for a section of interstate highway? What does it mean for a bridge, et cetera? And then there's sort of you know what we're currently spending. And that's that's called, you know, is is the deferred maintenance gap. And there's, it's the American Society of Civil Engineers does a pretty good job of estimating the, the deferred maintenance gap, uh, slightly under a trillion dollars. There's other independent groups that have come up with um, gaps that are about that, that same size, James. So there is this, this issue of you know, spending on, on taking care of this deferred maintenance problem. One of the things that I stress in my AEI essays, James, is don't just spend money under the same delivery system because this is, I think, a seven or eight year bill. After that, we might be back in the same situation we were before if we don't change the way that infrastructure is operated and maintained. But the other issue, James, is for some infrastructure, it is you know building out new systems and it would be broadband internet access, which could be 5G and uh, trying to get you know broader uh, coverage of high speed or at least some certain speed internet access. So, so when you just, one of the things that's, um, a bit maddening about the discussion is when you just talk about spending, you know, money. That's that's an inadequate um, level of discussion for infrastructure. It's more nuanced than that. It has to be discussed across sectors. Just spending money on new projects could make it worse because a governor might want to say, "Well, I want to get reelected. I'll take this federal grant. I, we don't even know if it's going to be grants or loans. Let's assume it's going to be a federal grant, and I'll install a new piece of infrastructure because it looks good for my reelection." But then my, my, my state, if it's a governor or if it's a mayor, my locality is stuck with the operation and maintenance of that piece of infrastructure for a very long time. So we have to be careful in how the programs are structured. And we really don't know much uh, currently, James, about there's not a lot of policy um, detail. Uh, the transportation secretary has ruled out increases in the gas or diesel tax, but he's also ruled out mileage based user fees or any sort of rates that you would charge for the use of of roads so so it's it's unclear where the the funding then is going to come from changes in the corporate tax i don't think are going to come close to what we need and it's not even close to being a user fee 
So there's a lot of issues with the infrastructure proposal um, as it is, is currently constructed, where it's almost impossible to really analyze it because it's so broad in general. And I, I'm going to jump to uh, Kyle in a second since you brought the corporate tax. But before I, um, I, I do that, Rick, uh, in my email box, I, I, I have un, an untold, uncountable number of reports from banks and consulting firms to, telling me about just the, the oceans of private capital ready right. to be spent on infrastructure. I mean, right. For years, I've been getting these. That does not seem to be a reality that this plan addresses. Am I right? What what happened to that? Well, <laughs> so great question, James. So I th I think it's still on the table. If you listen to some of the things that the president says, including some of the remarks he made last night about how he's willing to uh, listen to new ideas, particularly in the infrastructure space, he's willing to uh, reach across the aisle. There have been two high level meetings in the Oval Office that include included Republican senators. I don't think the administration is adverse to additional public-private cooperation. And there's a whole lot of ways that, you know, that the, the public and the private sector could better cooperate to bring in that capital. This is not Gordon Gecko capital, James. These are uh, public and private pension funds that, that are very patient, that are very uh, sound investors that are looking for long-term reliable cash flows to match with their long-dated uh, liabilities and infrastructure, you know, uh, can offer that. So, so the, it can it, it's a win-win uh, situation. And I think the administration is open to that, James. It's really a question of how do you structure policy, and this is one of the the, the, the critical things, so that the the public interest is protected, right? So whatever the infrastructure is, whether it's a toll bridge or a, a toll road or a, a drinking water system, an electric system, we want reliability, we want safety, we want uh, rates to be affordable. So you protect the public interest while making it appealing for the private sector. And I have to say, James, of developed e countries that I'm aware of, the United States is dead last in structuring arrangements that are attractive to the private sector long term. And, you know, there's there's different ways to do it. Bundling, I mentioned earlier, of design and construction with o operation and maintenance. It's called a D-bomb contract. Um, it's been used in some cases, but not much in the United States. That can include a financing component. In, it's a 25, 30 year contract to take care of a, a bridge or a tunnel or an airport, a seaport, whatever it is. And you can structure that to attract private capital. The United States is, is way behind on this, James. And I think it's partly because of the state and local ownership, but it's partly just because we've done things the same way for 50 years. And uh, the state and locals often are a little bit um, risk averse when it comes to thinking about new ways of delivering. But we can borrow, the Canadians actually are the world leaders, in, I think, in, in structuring public-private partnerships and ways to incorporate private capital. So I'm hopeful, James, that a new infrastructure effort across sectors in the United States would do a much better job of thinking about how the public and private can cooperate to have this sort of win-win-win arrangement. All right. um, Kyle, as you sort of mentioned uh, earlier, uh, you know, part of the plan is to sort of begin to re at least partially reverse the Trump tax cuts. Uh, most talks have been about the corporate tax rate, taking that from 21 to uh, at least 28. Um, the Biden administration seems to have a, a different theory of tax competitiveness than what I've heard in recent years. Much of the talk, at least as I heard it, has been about we have all these other countries with much lower rates, so we need to cut our rate to something close, at least close to what uh, they're they're doing so we're we're competitive. The U.S. has many great qualities. Maybe we don't have to be quite as close, but we should uh, we should cut that rate. Now it seems to be we need to raise our rate for interests of I think both revenue raising and perhaps equity and and uh, we're going to solve the competitiveness issue by getting those other countries to raise their rates. So. Previously, we were, I don't know, rate, you know, lowering the bridge. Now we want to raise the river. I, I'm not sure how that metaphor works. So how much success really do you think we're going to get in getting other countries to think about tax competitiveness differently? And does that ultimately influence what we do? Yeah, I, I mentioned this. Uh, a big point of the Biden administration has been addressing what they call a race to the bottom. Uh, it, Corporate tax rates over the past you know, 20 years or so have come down. Now, that's 
that's paused a little bit, um, but if, even uh, so France, for example, they're scheduled to reduce their corporate tax rate from somewhere around 32% down to 25% come next year. So, so there, there's certainly a trend towards lower corporate taxes, um, at least the statutory tax rate. Other co countries also have provisions uh, to attract um, types of different types of profits. A uh, popular provision in some countries is called a patent box, which is a special lower tax rate on the returns to intellectual property. Um, Hungary, for example, they have a corporate tax rate of nine percent, and they and it's actually four and a half percent if it's intellectual property income. So you have really, really low rates there. Um, and yeah, Bi Biden, the Biden administration is betting on to some degree. Um, the ability to reverse some of that. So saying to um, countries that, uh, you know, hey, we have this corporate tax system. Um, we're going to have, we have these provisions called the shield. We're going to make it actually harder for our companies and other companies to do cross-border investment between the United States and your country unless you bring up the tax rate to be closer to the United States because we think that you having a rate that's much lower than ours is harmful um, to the United States, but also harmful in just in general for tax policy throughout the world, because they also believe that just having higher corporate and capital taxes is good because it, it makes the tax system progressive overall. Um, I mentioned this very briefly that you know, I, I'm skeptical to, uh, of this of this uh, being successful. I mean, you've already seen pushback from Ireland. Um, you know, of course, they have a 12 and percent tax rate and they've built a lot of their economic growth on the ability to attract investment from the United States and other large economies with their lower corporate tax rate. Um, you've had pushback from Hungary. Um, and I think you'll have pushback from other countries where you know they they want they think that it's appropriate that they you know how they've decided to raise revenue is it, is appropriate and the United States shouldn't have too much say into how they they structure their tax system. So I, I am skeptical. This is, there's there's kind of a um, an analogous situation in the world of um, climate policy as well um, in that. Some lawmakers think that the best way to address climate change is to get countries into a club to all price carbon in, at the same level so that there's no leakage. You know, the production doesn't go to China or India. So you got to force them to um, change their policies to, to be closer to ours. But I think that, that it's very difficult to do that sort of stuff. And I think what would be better is if the United States structured our system to raise revenue in less distortive ways. I mean, you can structure a corporate tax to raise revenue without distorting investment. Um, I mentioned 100% bonus depreciation, expanding expensing to other investments, allowing companies to fully deduct. Um, I think, you know, again, looking back to 2016, um, Republican lawmakers were thinking about border adjusting the corporate tax, making it look more like a value added tax. Big upsides to that is that you don't have to worry about these issues of profit shifting or shifting production overseas. The corporate tax is indifferent to that. Um, so I think there are ways that you could address this issue without you know, betting on, I think, the unlikely chance that you can convince other countries to do to do, uh, change their policy. Yeah, one other quick thing, Kyle. Uh uh, from the Biden administration, are they, it's not just they want to raise that corporate rate. It seems they want to tax companies differently because they seem very worried that some companies are, aren't paying enough in corporate income tax or they're not paying anything. So this all seems to be a different philosophical change, how, how you tax the corporation in America. What, what, what is the thinking there? Yeah, I think the, uh Another motivating factor is the perception that, especially after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that not enough corporations are paying enough tax. And you see headlines that are somewhat shocking, you know, so-and-so company um, earning big profits but paying zero in corporate tax in 2020 or 2019. Um, I think you know, several companies, companies have been named, whether it's Amazon um, or Apple in, in the past. Um, and I, I think, yeah, I think that a lot of the motivated, the policies are motivated by that. I talked about this 15% minimum book tax. 
this minimum tax is aimed specifically at those headlines. So, and I think that 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 sort of policy making is problematic. I mean, I th yeah, yes, the the headlines are kind of shocking, but like you know what you're what you're looking at, what you're seeing there is kind of a difference between what's called book income, income that you report to your shareholders, um, which is meant to measure the performance of a firm relative to tax liability, which is based on taxable income. Taxable income is defined differently for different purposes. I mean, the tax code is meant to raise revenue fairly um, among corporations. It's meant to treat businesses that make investments. Um, it's supposed to reduce their liability with expensing. And there, there, there are policy differences there. And I think that, um, yeah, I think that the administration um, is at least politically attuned to this um, this perception that there are low effective tax rates. But again, I, I don't think it's necessarily good uh, good policy. I, you can if you think the corporations are not paying enough tax. I mean, address the the reasons for the underlying reasons. I mean, you know, green energy credits, for example, or credits for research and development, these things reduce tax liabilities. And if you think that that's a bad thing, then get rid of those. But of course, I don't think lawmakers will. Those credits are very popular politically. Right. Uh, again, let me just remind the panelists here, also feel free to jump in and answer any question I ask any other panelists. So if you want to unmute your mics, obviously that's, that's something. Phil, uh, what can this administration do uh with zero republican help uh that answer seems to be changing i mean i i thought i thought they could do a reconciliation bill then it seemed like they could do more than one re reconciliation bill now i i've heard crazy theories about ma maybe many reconciliation bills they can do the uh, reconciliation for 2030 or something they can do it this year i don't know do we have a firm grasp exactly what this we've been talking about these two big bills and perhaps some other plans in the years going forward do we really know what the, what this administration can really do kind of on its own? Well, I think we shouldn't underestimate just what executive branch action totally disconnected from Congress can accomplish. I, I think that's been the sort of trend in American policymaking in, in, in recent decades. It's certainly not something new with the Biden administration, um, but you, you've really seen uh, a, a lot of very important initiatives that are just run out of the executive branch. And so they, there's also sort of an effect where the ambition, the policy ambition goes to look for those things more than it looks to go past new laws because passing new laws is seen as so, uh, such a, such a long shot. And this is at least something they can control. So, you know, to take student loans again, as an example, that's something where the Department of Education has a lot of a lot of power, um, where the president can really uh, make make some things happen um, w without having to go to Congress, potentially. Um, and you know, I think presidents have been pushing the limits on that. You have an eviction ban that's pushed out from the executive branch um, during this COVID pandemic. That's a hugely consequential policy. Uh, it's it's not so clear how 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 legal it is. I think there's a challenge pending right now, um, but a lot of very important policies. Um, I, I think I, I do want to make one point, which is we've seen a kind of bipartisan shift in the, the philosophy of spending. And I think Scott got to this a little bit in his remarks, but you know, if you go back ten years, when the Tea Party Congress had just been uh, elected in, in in the 2010 midterms, and you look at those fights that that President Obama had with with John Boehner and the Republican Congress back then, you had a pretty stark divide. You had a president who who wanted more spending to to combat the Great Recession, and you had a Republican Party that really just actually wanted spending to go way down, and that created quite an impasse. And uh, you know, we had a debt ceiling showdown. We had some government shutdowns in the years to follow. Um, it, it was a real, it was a real, dif a real difference in views. I think today we have a party in President Biden's Dem Democratic Party that wants to spend a whole lot more money, 
and a Republican Party that wants to just spend a lot more money. Um, and that's a really big shift. You know, when the Republican senators come and make their counteroffer on this infrastructure bill, it still comes in at something like $600 billion. I mean, th those kinds of numbers were foreign to uh, a, a lot of po policy discussions it, it, not so long ago. And we generally, we've shifted from talking about hundreds of billions to just everything is denominated in the trillions now, which to me is a, a little bit uh, scary. Um, so I think there is potentially room, especially on this spending front, to get together a bipartisan coalition. Um, you know, we saw it a lot over the last year with, with responding to COVID. We passed huge, you know, historically large supplemental spending bills with overwhelming bipartisan support in 2020. Um, you know, obviously that that wasn't the way that the, the March 2020 relief bill was, was passed. It was passed with 50 votes using budget reconciliation. And there may be another round of that after the Senate parliamentarian said uh, that, she, that she believed it, it would be legal uh, or permissible for Democrats to pass a, a revised budget and therefore get another bite at reconciliation. But, you know, Joe Manchin has said he doesn't think that that's the way to go. I think Kristen Sinema, an, another centrist uh, Democrat from Arizona in the Senate, ha has expressed reservations. Neither of them seems all that keen on getting rid of the filibuster. So I, I do think that the, the next phase is going to be searching out what, what you could peel off some more centrist Republicans to support, and, and a lot of this spending, uh, they can be given their piece of the pie uh, along the way. I, th I think just trying to proceed with 50 votes really exposes the fissures within the Democratic coalition. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's easy to pretend that everyone is on the same page when you're just putting out proposals that, that, that you don't expect to go anywhere, but when you're actually trying to pull together 50 votes and not lose a single one, really find out what people want. And uh, I think there's more intramural uh, differences within the Democratic Party than they'd like to admit. Uh, Scott, let me just uh, briefly tick off some of the things in the American Family Plan. We have a, a child tax credit extension. Uh, we have some child care spending. We have paid family, medical leave, uh, universal pre-K, free community college, some Pell Grants. Uh, some more um, Obamacare credits, IRS funding. Uh, not not even done. There's more. There's more to that list. But this is supposed to be about you all, not me. So I'm going to end 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 my ticking off that list. Can I ask you that? Because uh, when you chatted earlier, you talked about some unintended consequences. Uh, that's a lot of moving parts. That's a lot of money and a lot of different programs. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to tick off all the <laughs> potential unintended consequences for each of those, but. Could you give a flavor of you think the the uh, the risks that maybe aren't being addressed in this sort of rush to to spend money? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I mean the the one uh, the policy debate that I've kind of been most involved in uh, so far this year has been around the expansion of the child tax credit, um, which you know has been a bipartisan policy. It was uh, it was it was bipartisan when it was created. Um, in 1997, I believe. Uh, it's been expanded multiple times over the years by Democrats and, and Republicans. Uh, the TCGA, TCJA um, exp doubled it, actually, um, from 1,000, maximum of 1,000 to a maximum of 2,000. Um, and, and then uh, what the Biden administration did was uh, to expand it in a number of ways, uh, to allow older kids to get it. Um, most importantly, uh, it, be it became available uh, to everybody, whether parents are working at all or not. And, um, and so what that does is, is it sort of risks taking us back to uh, an era in anti-poverty policy um, that, you know, I'd associate with the 1980s um, uh, and earlier, where uh, if you were, um, if you could uh, uh, compile, assemble, enough safety net benefits from enough programs, it was possible to uh, to have a family without working um, or at least without working on the books. Um, and it was possible uh, to uh, to raise uh, children without uh, without being part of a married couple. And 
over decades, you know, as, as the old cash welfare program expanded, um, we saw an, uh, an increase in single parenthood, for instance, and, and we saw an increase in uh, the number of non-working single parents. Um, the number of kids growing up uh, without a, a working parent present in the home and living without a father, for instance. Now, those things uh, are bad for, uh, for upward mobility, um, for longer term poverty. Um, and, uh, and because of that, there was bipartisan consensus in the 1990s that we should reform uh, our, our, our safety net policies. And, and we did. We uh, created a more generous safety net for workers. Um, we made it tougher to receive safety net benefits without working. Um, poverty among kids fell, poverty among single parents fell. Um, and, and that was a bipartisan uh, a set of policies in the 1990s. Now this, this new child tax credit, um, you know, which, which is essentially a child allowance, it's 3,600 bucks for younger kids and 3,000 uh, for older kids every year, threatens to take us back uh, to this era where, uh, where there are incentives um, not to work uh, or, or not to marry. Um, that's the kind of thing that has been shrugged off um, by a lot of folks on the left. Um, and it's also been sort of, uh, I, I would say, minimized um, by a lot of folks on the right who are more concerned about um, subsidizing uh, children and parenting more generally because they have a lot of people this mistaken belief that it's become uh, uh, more expensive to raise kids over time and that, and that even middle class and upper middle class families uh, need to be subsidized in that regard. So that's just one instance where, you know, I, I think this relentless focus on, you know, just just getting more money into the hands of, uh, of households, um, the, the immediate benefits are pretty clear. Giving people more money uh, reduces poverty. Um, the child tax credit expansion has certainly done that. Um, uh, you know, providing uh, more child care subsidies will make it easier to pay for, for child care. Um, but there's not a lot of attention to the longer term negative consequences uh, that 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 could uh, follow, and and that's something that I think even Republicans increasingly are are forgetting. These are lessons that that we knew once, or that conservatives knew once, um, and that they're forgetting. And as as Phil said, sort of in a race to kind of um, you know offer more of this more of the same, but just not quite as extravagant uh, as as what the left is offering. Does this new thinking is it, has it been driven by lessons learned? Have there been a series of economic studies that show we need to do things differently? Is it is it more kind of a, a philosophical change of thinking? Is it just driven by sort of changing political co coalitions and who who's in what party? What sort of is, is driving this really shift in thinking that we saw in the 90s until today? Yeah, I think it's a complicated question. I think part of it uh, has to do with um, how far out we are from things like, um, you know, having a situation where, uh, you know, as many as 14% uh, of, of, uh, of kids um, uh, were receiving AFTC benefits um, or a situation where, um, you know, we had hyperinflation in the 1970s. People don't worry about inflation anymore. Um, you know, no one has experienced the kind of nervousness that Bill Clinton uh, confronted when he took office in 1993 about uh, the bond market and what it was going to do about uh, about deficits. Um, so to some extent, uh, I think policy is a little bit of a victim of its own success. To some extent, um, there's there's an element of cohort replacement uh, going on. I think a lot of um, younger uh, folks, in, including younger um, folks on the center right, uh, who have kind of been through, you know, uh, the financial crisis and the Great Recession, and then a global pandemic. Uh, it's it's caused a lot of uh, of insecurity um, and a lot of openness to the idea that we need the federal government uh, to take care of us, which I think is is just misguided and, and based on a misreading of a lot of of data. But I think I think that's what's driving. Okay. Uh going to ask a few uh, questions uh, from the uh, from the audience here as we sort of you know enter sort of the last section of this uh, of this event. Let me uh, let me let me start with uh, oh they're all good questions but let me let me start with uh, this question again. We might want to unmute our mics. Anybody can answer. I'm not going to direct it to anybody. Uh, feel free to give me your two cents. So here's a question: um, Can we create a tax plan? that finances the Biden infrastructure bill 
that does not increase the tax burden on corporate and household income. Are there other forms of consumption we can tax? If so, is this prudent? Um, I'm guessing may, uh, uh, it sounds like Rick and, and Kyle may have uh, something to say, but y'all might have uh, something to say as well. Though I'll uh, I'll begin with uh, I'll, I'll begin with Rick on this. Yeah, um, but it gets into corporate tax that is, you know, it's kind of odd for me to be discussing because it was the infrastructure debate never never really you know got into corporate tax because it was always a focus on other other forms of. Uh, of raising revenue uh, user fees. But, you know, about the, the question is a bit odd because, you know, it gets to the incidence of the of the corporate tax. Who pays the corporate tax? It's, you know, uh, certainly a lot of uh, incomes or households of modest incomes, you know, are going to pay that that corporate tax. My sense is that the basic answer to that question is James is no. I don't the, the proposals I've seen, I don't think are going to um, raise the amounts of money, you know, that are needed to address the deferred maintenance gap, uh, you know, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so, so it just, it just seems like it's, it's headed in the wrong direction. We should be talking about ways to uh, revitalize the user fee model that goes back to the days of President Eisenhower. Um, you know, the gas and diesel taxes were in that at both the state and, and federal level were in that mold. Um, and also what the state of Oregon has done with mileage-based user fees. We should be talking about permitting reform. We should be talking about this discussion of bringing in more uh, private investment. And I've written a lot uh, for AEI about ways that we can extract more value called value capture by better managing the existing system and just taking a different approach to uh, the portfolio of assets that a state or local government owns in the infrastructure space can can. Uh, capture more value. The Australians did this with what's called an asset recycling program. We should adopt an asset recycling program based on the Australian model in the United States. We don't, we can get more value out of the existing system. The other thing I'll, I'll end with on this, James, is just technology. So over the past 10, 15 years, I've witnessed a quiet technological revolution in infrastructure delivery uh, that is astounding. It's not just driverless cars, it's smart stoplights. That, that have cameras and sensors, it's LED street lights, uh, it's new materials, it's liners and water pipes where you can renovate the water pipe without uh, digging it up just by pushing this, forcing this liner through with, with compressed hot air. And there's a whole bunch of these things. And I think a bill needs to encourage the state and local governments to, to adopt proven technologies that will improve the environment, also just improve the way infrastructure is managed and it'll capture more value. So this, the discussion about the, the corporate tax is a bit alien to me, and I'm kind of sorry to see the discussion go in that direction, but I'll leave it to Kyle. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just add, a, there's there's really no way to you know finance infrastructure without it being it falling on people at the end of the day. A corporate tax, the incidence is gonna fall on workers, shareholders, individual income taxes, that's a little bit more direct, so it seems more obvious. User fees, same deal, um, or user fee like taxes, that's gonna fall on individuals. Borrowing, well, that's just gonna be financed by taxes in the future that people are going to have to, um, so the, the question is what's the best way to finance infrastructure? And I, I agree with Rick that user fees or user fee like taxes are superior to the corporate income tax. It, what's important here in my mind is aligning the benefit of that, uh, of the infrastructure, the use of the road um, with the costs associated. So if you're driving on the road, you are taking up space, you're causing noise, pollution, congestion, um, and having a gas tax or a vehicle mile travel tax, that that is pricing that externality or cost you're putting on the road in wear and tear or you know, using the road that other people can't use. So I think it would, it's not, it, I think it's not just a more efficient source of revenue, but it's also, it's, you know, it's fair in a way that you are aligning the co the costs and the benefits of, of infrastructure. Uh, it turns out we have a question, uh, another tax question, which uh, so I'll just shoot it right back at you. Uh, uh, Kyle, and it sounds like I wrote it, but I did not write it. The, the people out there wrote it. It's this. Uh, do you think the increases in corporate tax rates and capital gains at the levels proposed by the Biden administration would disincentivize investment? 
and I guess hurt economic growth. Yeah, it's a complicated question because it also depends on, like for the corporate tax, it depends on the tax base. And I mentioned that what Biden administration should be also addressing, but is not, is the treatment of capital expenses in the base. So under current law, short-lived assets can be expensed immediately. And what that means from uh, an investment perspective is that the corporate tax, even at the 21%, is not putting a burden on new investment. So it's a more efficient way to um, have to levy the corporate tax. But as that phases out, the, the burden of the corporate tax increases on new investment. And if you raise the rate on top of that, yes, it's going to discourage investment uh, in, in the United States. So you, I think they should be cautious about raising the tax rate, especially if they're not going to address expensing. Capital gains taxes, it's maybe a little bit more, even more complicated than that. I mean, capital gains taxes is a tax on saving, not directly on investment. So to the extent it impacts saving behavior, that could reduce the availability of financing for new investment. So what corporations use to finance is saving in the economy. And if you raise the tax on capital gains, it's going to reduce the availability of that saving. But you know, again, it's all, that's also complicated because there's a lot of saving out there already. A lot of it comes from overseas, for example. So raising the tax on capital gains might have an impact on saving, but you know, it's unclear how much that may impact domestic investment. So it might make you know us poorer because we're saving less. We have less income for the future. But you know, maybe our capital stock remains about the same because instead, you know. Exxon gets financing from German savers instead of American savers. Uh, I, and just briefly, kind of uh, very similar to what I asked Scott earlier, has it, it seems that the thinking has changed on how you tax, at least in some quarters, like how you tax capital and the potential downside or anti-growth impact of how you tax capital. Has that, has that changed? Maybe I get too much of my economic uh, wisdom from Twitter, but it seems like it's changed. Kyle. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, I thought that that was uh, for for Scott. Um, no, I, I, I threw it because I mentioned it, but just just very briefly, has the thinking changed at all about how we tax capital and the wisdom of taxing capital? And I I Twitter tells me it's changed. I, I don't know. It, it 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 may have. I, I think what I think what's important uh, is not just the rate but the base. I think in the past there was a lot of emphasis on what's the tax rate on capital gains, what's the tax rate on dividends or tax rate on corporations. Those things are important because tax avoidance is an issue. If you have rates that are way too high, people want to shelter their income. Um, and it does at some margin, but there's also the importance of how you define the base. Um, so if you know, it, I, I think Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, I think did a good job in some respect in defining the corporate tax base a little better. Um, so you know, it's, it's both. It's both things, but yeah, I, I think. Um, but it, it's changed a little bit. But maybe for the Democratic Party, I still see the same sort of um, uh, idea that you know taxing capital income is going to make the tax code more progressive. Yes, it is. Um, but you know the costs of that. Um, you know there's you know there's still economic downsides to it. So I, I don't know if it's changed that much. I just think. The, the discussion of the exact policies might be slightly more nuanced. Okay, I'm gonna. I have. I have, uh, I have two more questions, uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, and again, everyone, anyone can jump in, but I'm gonna direct first one to Phil, and then one to Scott. Um, again, uh, from 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 the people, Phil. Um, are we stuck permanently in gridlock where the parties are unable to work together in Congress, and the executive branch does most of the governing? Is that just what it means? Is that just American? Is that just American politics from here on out? Well, the, the great AEI scholar of, of days gone by, Herb Stein, had the famous line, if something can't go on forever, it won't. Uh, and I think a lot of us ha have, have felt like this just two sides closely matched, smashing their heads against each other in Congress without any real... Uh, willingness to compromise is, is one of those trends that can't go on forever. Uh, it's sort of 
effectively the end of constitutional government in America, and we have to improvise ways of, of working around the Constitution instead of working through it. Uh, and so it has to end. And I have to say, I've been waiting for it to end for, for a good long while now. Um, and here we still are. Um, I, th I think in some ways the congressional leadership sees their job as sustaining this tension and fueling it to some degree because uh, it, it allows them to frame the political issues in ways that they think are maximally advantageous going into the next election. And there's this insistence with, with really very little circumspection that every election is the most important election in the history of the republic. And people really believe that. And as long as, as long as the members of Congress believe that, they're willing to follow the leadership in defining everything in maximally confrontational terms. And they're not willing to sort of search out the strange bedfellows that need to be the, the, the hallmark of, of, of American congressional politics. Uh, at some point, members, members possess the ability, the backbenchers in Congress possess the ability to say, hey, wait a second. Maybe I and my colleague from across the aisle really do agree on more than we've been allowed to work on together. Maybe we care about moving certain kinds of policies and moving influence back into Congress and away from the executive branch and enough that we're willing to force our leadership to, to do things in a different way. But uh, as I said, I've been waiting for that moment and it hasn't hasn't really come um, both both party leaders, um, especially Mitch McConnell on the Republican side, have, have, have proved to be kind of geniuses at holding their coalitions tightly together, focused on exactly the issues that, that keep the parties fighting with each other. So uh, I, I do believe it has to come to an end at some point, but but I, I, I wouldn't want to bet on it just, just yet. And Scott, what is your favorite idea maybe people are talking about it a lot right now, maybe they should be, very simply, to reduce poverty and increase opportunity in America? That is a great question. Um, you know, I, I think uh, that what the what conservatives, what, what everybody ought to be thinking more about is less um, how to reduce point in time poverty uh, and more about how to reduce intergenerational poverty, how to reduce concentrated poverty, um, uh, how to reduce the number of kids who spend their entire childhood in poverty. And I think the solutions that you would uh, that that you would want to push for the latter are not the same solutions you would want to push if your main goal was just to reduce point in time poverty. The advocates of of the child allowance. Um, uh, that, that President Biden um, uh, has has enacted um, and, and would like to make permanent, uh, you know, the, their their policy will reduce the point in time child poverty rate uh, by uh, probably not fifty percent, but but pretty close to that. Um, and if that's your goal, then that's a pretty effective way of doing it. Um, but if in the process of doing that, you also encourage more uh, choices that will hurt kids in the long run, uh, then you're not going to solve the problem of limited upward mobility. So uh, for upward mobility, I, I think we've got to uh, take a look at early childhood. Um, this is an area where, you know, there's just not a lot of creative thinking. I think the left uh, warmly embraces Head Start, which doesn't actually have uh, great results to show for it. Um, and the right sort of throws up its arms and says Head Start doesn't work uh, and the federal government can't really do anything um, and exits the stage. Uh, I've proposed in the past having uh, an office of opportunity in the White House uh, that would essentially seed a bunch of local experiments uh, to improve the school readiness of kids so that uh, when they start school, we can reduce some of these test score gaps that are already massive by the time uh, the, kids, the kids enter school. I think another promising area would be uh, to make it easier uh, for families who would like to move their kids to a neighborhood that promotes upward mobility better uh, to give them more options. And, and that would involve attacking things like exclusionary zoning and land use uh, regulations that make it too expensive uh, for a lot of people to live in, in certain neighborhoods. 
Um, or you could attack it in the way that the President Biden actually proposed on the campaign trail, um, but hasn't really emphasized so far, uh, which is to do something around housing vouchers, um, where you encourage uh, families uh, who get these housing vouchers to actually move to specific neighborhoods uh, that the data shows are better for kids um, in terms of long run outcomes uh, than, than our other neighborhoods. Um, so I think focusing more on place and focusing more on early childhood uh, are, are probably the, uh, the, the, the most promising um, ways to go forward. Oh, that's uh, that's fantastic. Oh, yes, did someone want to jump in? Okay, then we'll we'll finish up. Scott, that was fantastic. Uh, appreciate it. I think that's the, we're at the end of sort of the uh, domestic policy portion of uh, of the event. Uh, we will be back again at about ten thirty five to uh, to discuss uh, dis discuss foreign policy. So please. Uh, so we will take a brief break. Please uh, grab yourself a, a midday snack uh, and we will see you back here at 1035. Thanks every all the uh, panelists for, uh, for showing up. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.
Good morning. I am Corey Shockey, that, and I lead the Foreign and Defense Policy Team at the American Enterprise Institute. And I am delighted this morning to chair this panel on the foreign and defense policy implications of the Biden administration's first 100 days. And I have the pleasure of uh, introducing a lineup of foreign and defense policy talent that is the equivalent of the Yankees batting order of the late 1920s, a murderer's row that included Gehrig and Ruth. And this morning we have for you, my predecessor as the leader of the foreign and defense team, Danielle Pletka, who created it in her 17 years as vice president of American Enterprise Institute. She has had a distinguished career as a senior professional staff member of Senate Foreign Relations Committee. She teaches Middle East policy at Georgetown. She's a regular on Meet the Press and has a terrific podcast here at AEI. Our second murderer in the lineup is Dr. Fred Kagan, who directs the Critical Threats Project at AEI. He's one of the architects of the surge in Iraq, a great military and defense strategist, the author of Lessons of a Long War and the End of the, and also a great book of history called The End of the Old Order, Napoleon and Europe. He's a former professor at West Point, holds a PhD from Yale. Dr. Derek Scissors uh, is a commissioner on the US China Economic and Security Review Commission. He's the chief economist of the China Beige Book, author of the China Global Investment Tracker, holds a PhD from Stanford, and got a start working international economics and energy in the Defense Department. And batting cleanup for us, Professor Colin Duick. He's the professor in the Shar School of Public Policy at George Mason University, the author of The Obama Doctrine, American Grand Strategy Today, a book out from Oxford. He's advised presidential campaigns. He's been a Rhodes Scholar and holds a PhD from Princeton. So my friends, where I would like us to start this morning is for each of you in that order, to let us know what you think the biggest departures are from the previous administration and whether they are improvements. Danny, why don't you start us? Thank you, Corey. Uh, first of all, I have to say thank you for that unbelievably gracious introduction. It is the first and probably the last time my name has ever been associated with a sports analogy. So I'm I'm doubly I'm doubly flattered. You know, look, um, it, it's 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 early to assess the Biden administration. So in some ways, in some ways, 100 days is really unfair. On the other hand, the president himself created this construct by making a big deal of it, going and speaking before Congress, making a series of pledges to all of us that, uh, that he was going to uh, achieve. But one of the things that I think was hugely important to a lot of us who work in foreign policy is, um, is that he articulated uh, as, a, as a candidate and even in his sort of most important speech before the Democratic National Convention, his commitment to democracy and human rights. And in that, he really sought to underscore, I think, what he perceived to be a difference with the Trump administration. Now, we can quibble about what the Trump administration's commitment to human rights was, uh, but certainly the president himself did not spend a lot of time thinking about the well-being and democracy uh, of, uh, of nations abroad when he thought about his foreign policy. It wasn't uh, up there on his list of priorities. The problem for me right now is that those changes that we've seen so far have been you know, really sort of bumper sticker in orientation. Now, Fred's going to talk about Iran and, and Afghanistan, and so I don't want to, I don't want to um, uh, sort of eat into into that. Although I think there are, uh, I think there are human rights, religious freedom, democracy questions that we need to focus on there. If indeed we have a president who committed to being the man who cared about these issues. But where I'd like to start actually is, is an area that, that I've been working on with a colleague of mine, Brett Schaefer from Heritage, and that's on the United Nations. You know, one of the things that we saw in the Trump administration was a very, very tough attitude toward the UN. And of course, in the year of COVID, we remember the president pulling us out of the World Health Organization, stepping down, less memorable perhaps, 
from the Human Rights Council. And there are a number of other areas where the Trump administration was pretty tough on these UN agencies um, for, I think, uh, for, I think, problems that most of us agree were problems. You know, the World Health Organization really fell down on the job in the face of the world's most terrible pandemic. The, the Biden administration has moved very quickly to both rejoin the Human Rights Council, rejoin the World Health Organization, reinstate U.S. support for an organization called the United Nations Relief Works Agency, which is dedicated solely to the provision of untied assistance to the Palestinians, and which has a record of teaching anti-Semitism, Jew hatred, anti-Zionism, anti-Israel. And the problem for me is not that the president chose to rejoin any of these organizations, that after all is the prerogative of the President of the United States and Joe Biden was elected fair and square. The problem for me is that he joined them without getting anything. He went back into all of these organizations with no mind, neither in writing nor in statements, to the problems that they that they clearly manifested. We have the Human Rights Council on which uh, such human rights luminaries as China and Venezuela and Saudi Arabia uh, have sat and China China was just recently reelected to 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 the council of the uh, at the, um, at the HRC. They spend more than 50% of their time condemning Israel. Okay to rejoin, but what did we get for it? Did we get any changes? Did we get any reforms? Did we get any commitments? Nada. World Health Organization, one of the most important things we need to do coming out of this pandemic is figure out how the world's premier health organization, the one organization we all have that is dedicated to helping give us early warning of a pandemic, instead decided to kowtow to the Chinese, downplay the pandemic, downplay the effects, um, and act, frankly, as a lobbyist for the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing. Rejoined it, no questions about getting to the bottom of that. You know, again, these are really, these are, these are symbolic. These aren't going to be things that, that, that are hugely important to, you know, to a, a guy who's driving a truck in, in Ohio. On the other hand, if you want to talk about the commitment the administration made, what we can see is, no, it's really just rhetoric. Similar, you know, on China, we're going to hear from Derek, who's wonderful on this topic. But, you know, on China, what we've seen is there have been some sanctions on Hong Kong, but nothing that really bites into the to, to, to Beijing in a serious way. On Russia, where we've seen you know, the attacks on Alexei Navalny, we've seen sanctions. Certainly some, although not as many as the Trump administration, but none on the oligarchs that Alexei Navalny underscored were most important to Putin. Nothing on Nord Stream 2, which is the uh, gas pipeline project that is so vital to the Russians to circumvent Ukraine. No sanctions there. That's going to get finished in the Biden administration. Last, just quick minute of, of, of you know, some of this sort of rhetoric versus reality problem that I see and I fear is going to persist. You know, again, the administration is racing to rejoin the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, but no mind to getting anything from the Iranians on the governance side. So this is an administration that cares more about democracy and more about human freedom than those awful people beforehand. I got some numbers for you because I know Derek loves numbers and I want him to smile at me. 227 people were executed in Iran last year. That's just apart from the number of uh, the number who died from COVID. Uh, this year, they took a, a uh, they took a hiatus. 27 people were executed in January. Uh, 13 more have been executed since then. Women's rights. Yeah, not really so much. None of that has been a priority. The only place that the Biden administration seems to worry about human rights is in Saudi Arabia. And I would argue there are other countries in the Middle East than Saudi Arabia. Last, not least, Syria. 177 people died in Syria. 138, 177 in March, 138 in February, 113 in January. Yeah, I know, you know, in half a million, that's a drop in the bucket. But if you're a government that cares about human rights, maybe you ought to have a plan on Syria, even apart from what the Russians and the Iranians are up to over there. Again, total radio silence. Not, you know, it's not all about Syria. It's not all about human rights. We have other exigencies. We have other challenges. China, Russia are very serious. 
But if you want to be an administration that touts yourself as one that is going to bring America back to its values, and that is something Joe Biden has said repeatedly, there's precious little sign that that's happening. Thank you, Danny. I think this issue of the gap between the poses they're striking and what they are actually willing to run risks to achieve and to commit effort and money to achieve is a really important one. And I notice in defense, for example, the administration is making a lot of bold claims in particular about managing a rising China, um, that a defense budget, so a defense strategy largely consistent with where the Trump administration was headed. But the national defense strategy that the Trump administration put in place in 2017 was contingent for its execution on a three to 5% year on year increase in real growth in defense spending. The Trump administration only did that for its first two years, and the Biden administration looks set to cut defense spending by about 2% in real terms. And so the gap between what they are claiming we are going to do and our actual ability to do it uh, is a worrisome gap that I think we already see opening after 100 days. But Dr. Kagan, where do you see continuity and discontinuity? in the first 100 days of the Biden administration's national security strategies. So first of all, um, Corey, thank you also for the introduction. And I can't believe I you spoke positively of the Yankees. Yes. Thank you. That was, <laughs> that was an amazing uh, bit of graciousness on your part. Uh, thank you very much for that. <clears throat> um, Look, then I, I, so I, I read through the State of the Union address. I never watch these things because I don't find the theater entertaining. Um, but uh, what struck me was that the 1990s are calling and they want their strategic pause back. Um, it, it, it isn't as if we've gone back to the time capsule of the Obama administration. We've gone back to the time capsule of about 1995 or maybe 1994 when there was really nothing much going on in the world. And we were the dominant superpower and we, we could pretty much do, you know, whatever we wanted, but we wanted to do nothing. And so we were going to reap peace dividends and we were going to focus on, um, in Lloyd George's expression, uh, building a land fit for heroes, um, having, having won the last war. Um, that's what the state of the union sounded like to me. And in that sense, it, it was, discontinuous um, in rhetoric from the previous administration, but it did reflect a larger continuity that I see in the national security discourse over the last few years, which I would put this way. Political reality in the United States is accelerating away from actual reality so fast you can see a redshift. And it gets worse and worse all the time. We simply are making noises about the world that have the most tenuous relationship to what is actually going on in the world. So one thing that the president didn't mention is that this month, the Russians mobilized and made every preparation for what, what would have been the largest and most complicated mechanized maneuver on the European continent since 1945 against Ukraine, not against Eastern Ukraine, against all of Ukraine. Could the United States and its NATO allies have stopped that maneuver? With our current posture, no. Now, you might say Ukraine isn't a NATO ally, although it, the, the threat of the invasion did prompt President Zelensky to request a NATO membership action plan, uh, which received a very chilly reception um, in Brussels, which certainly helped Putin's cause. Um, but okay, that's fine. The fact that Putin was able to do that around Ukraine means he could also do that around the Baltic states with whom we do have a treaty obligation. Could we defend them against this kind of uh, attack? Not with our current posture. So that's kind of a problem. Um, and it is a problem that should be very concerning to a commander in chief. 
Now, we had assessed all along that the Russians weren't actually going to invade. That was the general assessment. But that's not good enough. If we're serious about honoring our alliance commitments, if we're serious about standing up to aggressive revisionist dictatorships that seek to invade and occupy and control their neighbors, then we might one might at least speak about that in a State of the Union address. So the rhetoric here isn't even keeping pace with reality, let alone the actions. Uh, Danny promised that I would talk about Iran. I'm always happy to talk about Iran. I'm happy to talk about it more in questions. But let me just note in this context, I'm not going to talk about the nuclear deal now. If you want to talk about that in questions, we can, uh, we can talk about that. What I am going to point out is that the Iranians have had for years and retained the capability to close the Strait of Hormuz for some period of time with mines and missiles and various other things. And I, Derek probably has the figures off the top of his head, I don't, but rather a lot of the world's oil travels through that particular waterway. And it would be rather a massive disruption of the global economy if they did that. Now, it is a fact that the US and its allies could reopen the strait if the Iranians undertook to close it, but it would be a major military operation. And it would be much more problematic to conduct after we have completed the pivot away from the Middle East that the previous administration started, actually that the Obama administration tried to start, that the Trump administration tried to forward, and that this administration seems determined to carry through. And it will get harder and harder as defense budgets shrink, defense capabilities are reoriented on domestic priorities. And we focus like, like kids in a soccer game playing magnet ball on China as if that's the only problem in the world that we actually have to deal with or think about dealing with militarily. So that should concern us. Another thing that concerns me parenthetically is I did a, a search in the text for the word Iraq and found nothing, which is a rather distressing since there are American soldiers fighting in Iraq and fighting ISIS in Iraq, which is not defeated. And of course, confronting Iranian threats and being uh, targeted and killed periodically by the Iranians. You might think that a president, commander in chief in a State of the Union address would at least say the word, uh, but he did not. He did, of course, talk about Afghanistan. And he defended or attempted to defend one of the most unjustifiable, foolish, and irresponsible foreign policy decisions I can remember, and that's saying a lot. The United States has and has had, since the end of the Trump administration, less than a brigade's worth of troops in Afghanistan. President Biden and those who are echoing his and praising his, uh, his strategic decision talk about the war in Afghanistan as if it were still 2010, as if we still had 100,000 Americans there as if it was costing us a fortune on a day-to-day -day basis to maintain our presence there, as if we were taking casualties on a regular basis there. None of those things are true. The United States Army has more than 30 brigades in the active force, and significantly more than that in the active and reserve. We're talking about a troop level that is less than a 50th of the active force uh, I mean, of the of the of the U.S. Army uh, combat uh, units, um, can we not sustain that? Really, sure we could. So, why did we pull out? Um, I don't think the president has offered any very good answer to that. He has said things like, "We degraded Al Qaeda." That's true. We did. Um, but for those who are not professional military analysts. Degrade is a temporary condition. Degrade is not defeat. It's not destroy. And an organization remains degraded only if you continue to degrade it. The notion that we're going to continue to do that over the horizon is fanciful. If you want to picture U.S. Delta Force guys riding unicorns over Pakistan into the Konar River Valley, please do so. That is about as realistic as the over-the-horizon counterterrorism mission the president is talking about. And I will simply say, 
if you are if you imagine that Putin, Khamenei, Xi, and everyone else who wishes America ill didn't draw conclusions about America staying power from this decision, you're wrong. They noticed. The only other justification he offered was that there's lots of other Salafi jihadi movements out there. He didn't use that phrase. That's our phrase. Lots of other terrorist movements out there, which is true. And we at CTP have been tracking it. The, the global Al-Qaeda movement and ISIS movement has metastasized. It's extremely dangerous. I have yet to hear a single word from this administration about anything it intends to do about any of that. So we have it offered as a justification for this surrender to the Taliban, but not offered as an explanation for anything we're actually going to do about it. That's devastating. That's the current state of the policy. And whatever the continuity or discontinuity, if this continues, the consequences for American security will be very dire. If I may add one thing on Afghanistan, Fred, there were zero American soldiers killed in Afghanistan in the last year. And I think that reinforces your point that um, there is a mindset that uh, that the United States is fighting and dying in Afghanistan as opposed to providing help and support to an ally that is bearing enormous costs. Um, and, you know, the casualty figures for Afghan national security forces are eye-poppingly high. And yet Afghans continue to volunteer for their national security forces because they want the kind of Afghanistan that we are helping them build. And it does seem to me that a Biden administration that is striking poses about putting human rights and democracy promotion at the center of American foreign policy is running the risk of um, having its bluff called when both of those things collapse in Afghanistan because uh, we can't bear to uh, carry the burden any longer of zero casualties in the past year. It reminds me of that Onion uh, headline during the Iraq war that the nation's college professors weary of carrying burden of war. Next up, Derek Scissors. Uh, China is at the forefront of the administration's approach to the world. What's going on there? Continuity or discontinuity? Uh, well, first I should apologize. Uh, any feedback you heard was due to me recording what my colleagues said about me for future use against them. Uh, I, won't, I won't do that again uh, without muting myself. Um, you know, I have a controversial issue on the Trump administration with regard to trade and especially China, which was there was a lot more talk than action. Uh, it's unfair to do this to the Biden administration because it's early, as Danny said, but we're seeing the same signs here. Um, in 2019, uh, then-candidate Biden said China was not competition for us. Uh, 2021, he has said we have to spend heavily or China will eat our lunch. But spending heavily with you know trivial taxation in comparison to the amount of spending is really easy. It's harder for future generations, but it's easy for us. I, I don't find that at all reassuring with regard to a commitment on China. We have trade actions that are pressing and are not being discussed at all. We have China actions that are in fact painfully overdue. Those are being reviewed. Meanwhile, we have multiple huge domestic spending programs that are ready to go. There are definitely people in the administration, uh, Biden administration, who want sound sign of China policy, just as there were in the Trump administration. But we have not seen any sign this is a White House priority in terms of action. Talking, yes, but, but not acting in any way that would, that would be costly to the United States. I'm going to start with trade before going to China. Um, I am a fan of, of U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai. She doesn't have her deputies confirmed yet. Uh, nominations across the board have been slow because the administration is pushing spending programs rather than staffing itself, which is a little weird because you think you'd want to have your staff in place to implement the spending programs. Uh, we should be wrapping up free trade agreement talks with the U.K. and Kenya. Uh, and learning about what President Biden wants to do next. Uh, we're not doing those things. Most important on the trade side, uh, trade promotion authority expires July 1st. Trade promotion authority is the means by which Congress says, 
we will give you an up or down vote on trade so uh, your trade deals don't get amended to death and become impossible to pass. President Obama pushed very hard for it, I know, because I was involved in that push uh, as while being at AEI. President Trump used it for the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. There's no sign President Biden is even going to ask for it. Um, when you make a commitment, and this echoes uh, something what my colleagues have said, when you make a commitment to being better to your friends than President Trump was, which is a good commitment. President Trump was often not good to our friends, but you won't ask for trade promotion authority to possibly negotiate a trade deal. Uh, there's there's a, an inconsistency there. Uh, and I hope the Biden administration does get its act together and ask for TPA, but so far we there's no sign of that. Um, we're likely to see a larger trade deficit this year than last year due to economic recovery. We had strong economic data come out today. Um, that's going to encourage the administration into being similarly protectionist with regard to the trade deficit as a Trump administration. So I think we're going to see continuity in that respect. Specifically to China, I don't see China tariffs imposed by the Trump administration being raised this year. If the Biden administration were to raise them, the bilateral deficit with China is going to rise due to U.S. economic recovery, they would then get blamed. Easy, easy political points for Republicans. Uh, so I don't think we see China tariffs lifted at least this year. Um, as with the general trade situation, uh, we have seen very no action on China on trade, uh, good or bad. May is going to be important. Two different kinds of things. One, there should be the nomination for Undersecretary for Bureau of Industry and Security in Commerce. This agency is the one responsible for implementing export controls. The undersecretary position was never filled, not in four years, on a permanent basis under President Trump, which is a major mistake. The agency has not implemented export controls that were passed by Congress in the summer of 2018. Congress correctly said, we have a problem of selling China technology, we don't wanna sell them. And the Department of Commerce said, ah, I don't care, and has done nothing about it. So we should see this person be nominated and commit to export control implementation in May. If we don't see that, it's a big problem for the Biden administration as it was for the Trump administration. Another event in May is there was a Trump administration executive order blocking investment in companies that are linked strongly to the People's Liberation Army. The Biden administration delayed the implementation to May 27th, which is perfectly reasonable. They have the right to do that with an executive order. But this is a very big issue because it was a complete failure under President Trump. People have made comments about me loving numbers, so let me give you a couple numbers. Um, U.S. investment in Chinese stocks and bonds in China, according to the Department of Treasury, tripled under President Trump. That's kind of a weird trade war when money goes from $100 billion of Chinese stocks and bonds to $300 billion. That isn't the big problem. The big problem is the United States claims to have invested $2.6 trillion dollars in Cayman Islands stocks and bonds with the minor problem that there is no stock or bond market in the Cayman Islands. So it's money going into an offshore source and we're pretending that we don't know what happens after that. Well, a large chunk of it goes to China. US investment in Chinese stocks and bonds is probably on the order of $1.1 trillion and is soaring. This is a way for the Biden administration to differentiate itself from the Trump administration and to address an enormous problem. We're funding our enemies. Uh, maybe it's innocuous, maybe we're funding furniture makers, maybe we're funding the PLA, maybe we're funding firms conducting genocide. Uh, but we need to know that. We don't. The Trump administration talked about doing something about it, didn't get around to it. The Biden administration is up now. And if they don't take this on, they're not serious about China. Um, what's happening in the, in the period where the Biden administration is reviewing everything, which is their standard answer on China policy, is that Senate Democrats are in the lead, Senator Schumer. They have backing from Republicans in both houses. Um, there's a, a bill called the Endless Frontier, which is a federal research and development bill, which in general is a good idea. The question is whether it's going to be recognizable after all these amendments are attached by both Democrats and Republicans. And that's the problem with Congress leading. Congress had better instincts than President Trump on China. It has better instincts, I think, than President Biden on China. But it's very hard to start off with a good bill and get it through in recognizable fashion. And that's where we need leadership from the White House, which we are not yet getting. Uh, we will get a, a bipartisan bill subsidizing U.S. production of semiconductors. Um, that raises an, a, a final crucial issue, which is if you subsidize production of semiconductors in the U.S. and you create jobs and we make the chips here, all that sounds good. Where do the materials and equipment come from? Some of the materials are going to come from China unless we prevent that. 
The Trump administration did not act to lock China out of supply chains even after COVID. It talked about it, just didn't do it. The Biden administration is going to have to do it uh, or we're going to get extremely politically embarrassing outcomes like, yay, the US is producing lots of chips which we can't make without the Chinese. I am not an expert on military issues. And so I am skipping the very important part of US-China military competition. I will talk a little bit about politics and, and uh, human rights and climate change. The administration, my administration has rightly called out what's going on in Xinjiang, uh, which, which is the province where uh, Uyghurs are being put in concentration camps and forced sterilization is occurring. Uh, but as Danny noted, they haven't accepted any consequences of this. Um, you know, we're going to not buy Xinjiang co cotton, which is trivial, um, that not an important issue for the U.S. Um, this is worse in a sense than what happened to President Trump, because President Trump didn't care about human rights in Xinjiang or anywhere else. Uh, and, and the Biden administration does care, but it hasn't taken steps commensurate with its, its, its words. So there's an element of hypocrisy. We're not going to send U.S. political officials to the Olympics. Really? This is a genocidal government, but it's okay for athletes to go and support them and give them a huge public relations win. You know, if you're gonna use the word genocide, you need to act behind it. Um, and, and we're not seeing that yet. I hope we will, but we're not yet. Um, climate change, we're likely to get a, another, I know it's hard to believe, we're at $6 trillion in spending packages, but there's more coming. We're gonna at least get to eight trillion, large spending package on green energy, Right now, China dominates those supply chains. It will subsidize intensely to continue to control those supply chains. The administration hasn't even stated a principle on fighting climate change versus accepting China dependence. Uh, Nick Eberstadt, Evan Abramsky, and I had a, a, a cover story in National Review about the US has become truly uh, energy independent in a meaningful way, which is we're now a net energy exporter. That's an amazing accomplishment uh, after decades of depending on dictatorships for oil are we now going to move into depending on another dictatorship for green energy uh, equipment? You know, we need a statement from the administration on this that's definitive. We don't have one. Uh, in general, they say climate change is separate from other issues. I, I can't speak to the world of climate change, but I can tell you that will not work with the Chinese at all. There is no chance. The only way they will deal with us meaningfully on climate change is we placate them everywhere else. And anytime we don't placate them, they'll say, well, we can't really cooperate on climate change anymore if you're going to act this way. They've just done this, a version of this with Australia. Um, so there's a lack of realism in the administration's approach to China. And I, ho I hope it's temporary. They don't have their people in place. It's early. The reason I find it especially disturbing is, remember what I said at the beginning, in 2019, candidate Biden was completely unrealistic about China. Now he sounds realistic, but his administration still isn't. And that's what I'm looking for, uh, you know, some improvement on in May and afterward. Um, I'll add a couple of things about the about China and military issues, um, because the Pentagon is uh, is leaning way forward on this, and well, they should, right? They fear that we that our margin of war fighting uh, success has been chipped away to a point where we could actually lose a war that China starts over Taiwan, uh, attacks on other American allies in Asia. And so uh, Congress has been terrific on this, creating the Pacific Deterrence Initiative uh, and the potential for funding conventional missile deployments to the region that will help counter China's strongest uh, offense challenge. And they're also thinking very carefully about where vulnerabilities in our military supply chains exist. Uh, the issues that Derek was raising about uh, China being an essential supplier uh, to, to things we produce. Just one small example, rare earths, which are not actually rare, they're just messy and difficult to get your hands on. And so most advanced economies have pushed the mining and production refinement of them into places that have lower environmental and labor standards. And China had a 15 year policy to invest in those, to undercut other global suppliers and create a dominant market position. 
it's not the law of gravity that China is essential to global refinement of rare earths. The Defense Department and the Energy Department in the Trump administration recognized that and began to try and open up both mines and processing facilities in the United States and in trusted allies like Australia. But we need to really also do what Japan did in 2010 after China used its chokehold on rare earths to cut off Japan's supply. They incentivized innovation to reduce reliance on rare earths in their production. And we need to think as creatively as that because um, you know, Secretary Austin is right that China is the pacing challenge for the American military. Um, but China's advantages of not requiring public consent, uh, not uh, being able to forcibly take information from its so-called commercial enterprises, uh, we need to put a lot more creativity and a lot more effort and actually also a lot more money into those challenges. And I don't see indications in the Biden defense budget that we are seeing that kind of focused attention. Um, and I hope my other panelists will comment on that when we come around to the questions and the free fire point. But before we do that, I would really like to hear from Professor Colin Duick on what all of this means for conservative foreign and defense policy. Where do you see uh, the state of play for conservatives and where do you see it headed in the Biden administration? Thanks, Corey. By the way, I always take notes on whatever Derek says because he reminds me of Babe Ruth in more than one way, um, the Bambino. So um, first of all, just on this point about convergence and divergence, uh, I, I agree with a lot of what was said that there are some striking uh, divergences. I mean, obviously the Biden administration puts climate change as a top priority in a very different way from what the Trump administration did. Uh, divergence on Iran policy, uh, divergence on personnel. I think in a way what you're seeing is kind of the return of the Obamanots. I mean, there's a lot of the same people coming back and some of the same assumptions at least. Uh, however, I think there's a lot of convergence actually more quietly uh, between Trump and Obama. Um, this accelerated drawdown from Afghanistan, at least a rhetorical hard line on China. The notion that foreign policy needs to be tied more directly to middle class or working class concerns, right? This was something that I think Democrats did get the message from the Trump years. Uh, frankly, the notion that the president is the leader who will do what he likes on foreign policy. I mean, that's consistent regardless of administration. They're going to claim executive authority in a lot of ways. Um, so there are uh, continuities in some ways on trade, protectionism, uh, skepticism toward arguments for new military intervention. And this goes back to Obama. So this is now, you know, a decade, really, which is worth, which is worth keeping in mind. It's, it seems to be bipartisan. Um, so those are con points of convergence, actually, between Obama and Trump that you don't hear about as much from partisans, I think, on either side. Now, uh, just to loop back to your question about conservatives. I think the Trump era showed that um, there are underlying differences between different kinds of conservatives on foreign policy, which was maybe not as obvious before 2016, but now it's blindingly obvious. There's a range of opinion, right, even in Congress, but certainly outside of Congress with the general public. You have more hawkish activist uh, conservatives, you have non-interventionist conservatives and libertarians, and then you have kind of everybody in between. Um, as long as Trump was president, I think he was able to get the support of most Republican voters, not necessarily most conservative commentators, but most Republican voters on his foreign policy, along with uh, pretty much everything else. But now that he's left the White House, that debate is, is wide open. And, and um, so there are some underlying differences. And in a way, this goes back decades, right? If you think about the, the non-interventionist wing of the party, somebody like a Senator Rand Paul or the more activist wing, they're all now going to feel free to make their case regardless of Donald Trump, and that's exactly what they're doing. And there are also people in the middle. Uh, somebody like Senator Cruz, I think, just sort of positions himself in the middle between, between those two positions. Um, now, the thing that's worth keeping in mind about the history of it is that it's the middle position among conservatives that's actually always been the pivotal group. The people who 
uh, for example, in the county where I live have uh, license plates that say, don't tread on me, right? They're not necessarily interested in every foreign crisis, but they're also pretty hawkish when you scratch them hard enough. Um, so they're, they're uncomfortable with uh, long-term nation building missions and they've, they've made that clear. But at the same time, uh, hard line on a lot of issues, Iran, defense spending, counterterrorism, you just go down the list. And so Trump tapped into that. I think one of the things that Trump did that was interesting and unusual, he showed that you could create a new coalition. He sort of built a coalition that allied the non-interventionists to the hardliners, right? We, we didn't realize that was even possible, but he did it. He did it. And so he shook up a lot of orthodoxies. He changed the conversation. Um, he did something and he did it precisely by not running as a dove or a pure non-interventionist. He, he's not a Ron, Ron Paul, for example, right? Um, so he was hardline on China, hard, sounded hardline on defense, on counterterrorism. He wasn't just a pure dovish candidate, but he was withering in his critiques of what he considered to be failed past interventions. So that, that allowed him to connect with the Rand Paul faction. So uh, that worked politically for him within the party for as long as he was president. Now, um, I think it's in the, in the basketball terms, I would call it a jump ball. I think in the next two, three years, you're gonna see a wide variety of types of Republican leaders and candidates who are gonna make their case apart from Donald Trump on policy, depending on their own convictions and on where they think the party's headed. And this could go in a lot of different ways. Um, you could see candidates who are who take the lesson from the Trump years that the party needs to be um, more protectionist, more non-interventionist, more nationalistic, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, you could also see candidates who, um, whatever their personal favor or disfavor towards Donald Trump, take a position that is that is more activist on foreign policy and pretty energetic or vigorous. Um, and I will just point out that if you look at public opinion polls, there's a lot of misperceptions about conservative opinion over the last few years. Actually, the average Trump supporter, never mind the average Republican, the average core Trump supporter supports NATO. And this was true throughout the Trump years. If you look at, for example, Chicago Council polls, Pew, Gallup, people liked the idea in the end that he was shaking things up and demanding more from our allies, but they were they're basically pro-NATO, according to the public opinion polls. Um, so it is not the case that the average Trump supporter was calling for you know, the dismantling of the U.S. alliance system. It's, it's just not true. They supported his particular approach to increased burden sharing. Um, but that's a bit of a misperception. And if people think that's true, it might feed into misperceptions moving ahead. At the same time, there's no question he did tap into widespread ambivalence on some issues. I would say globalization and free trade would be a good example. As it turns out, we've all been taught a lesson that a lot of blue collar, non-college educated Republicans and conservatives uh, have mixed feelings at best about free trade and globalization. Trump tapped into that. He recognized it. He actually encouraged it. I would say he actively encouraged that feeling. And we're in a different world now politically. And there's other issues like that as well, Afghanistan. Um, however, on China, he actually did the opposite, right? He nudged the party in a more hardline direction. Um, and I actually think that's one of the major legacies of the administration. Um, so, look, I would say moving ahead, uh, one thing that you're already seeing is you're seeing increased sense among congressional Republicans that uh, a harder line on China is warranted on the merits of the case. Um, and, you know, Derek's certainly right that, that it's, it hasn't gone far enough. Uh, but um, this has really become, I think, a bipartisan issue. Democrats don't seem to have much else to say other than we agree. Um, so that's interesting. And the Biden administration, at least rhetorically, doesn't disagree. I think you're going to see Republicans rally in the coming years around a hard line on China, even including some surprising corners of the party that are otherwise more non-interventionist. I am struck by almost every faction the party agrees on this, even people who are very critical or skeptical of U.S. interventions in the greater Middle East tend to like a hard line on China. I think it's going to be a unifying issue for Republicans, and I think you're going to see presidential candidates in the next three years preparing for their run by rallying around that issue. And as a matter of fact, they should. Thank you. That's such an interesting point. And I really agree with you that we have seen China's increasingly repressive behavior at home and aggressive behavior internationally create a much stronger consensus 
uh, for a harder line on China, and not just in the United States, right? The government of Australia was the first one to object to Huawei um, components in 5G networks. Uh, we, we rolled in in support of Australia, not vice versa. Um, and I think uh, the way that the Chinese government is attempting to mobilize diaspora, that is, they don't acknowledge that Chinese Americans are actually Americans, they just think of them as Chinese, um, has, and are bribing public officials, uh, those kinds of things can't bear the scrutiny of public exposure. And one of the great advantages free societies have is that they live in the ecosystem of constant exposure. Um, and so one of the important ways that I hope the Biden administration, when it gets its China strategy together, will think carefully about is how do we use the tools of free societies to protect and advance free societies? Um, I think there's a lot of interesting work that can be done there. But we already have questions rolling in from people on the call, which absolutely delights me. And I am gonna give them priority over where I would have driven the conversation uh, because I'm thrilled to have this interactive. The first question, Fred, is to you. And it is, since you were one of the first voices to call out the Ayatollah wanting sanctions relief, can you discuss what you think the sequencing of the return to the JCPOA compliance is going to look like at this point? And this both for Fred and Danny. Uh, and why is Israel seemingly going along with this? Is this genuine cooperation or is Bibi giving Biden the rope to hang himself with? First Fred and then Danny. Thanks, Corey, and, and, and thanks to the questioner for a good question. Um, I think it's looking increasingly uh, like the order of events will be that in a series, either altogether or in a series of tranches, and even though everyone's denying this, I still lean more toward thinking there will be a series of tranches. Uh, the U.S. will announce uh, lifting of certain sanctions, and the Iranians will, after some delay, announce uh, compliance with some of the IEA uh, or some of the JCPOA requirements, some of the nuclear deal requirements. Um, and subsequent to that, the International Atomic Energy Agency will confirm that the Iranians have in fact complied uh, with that, uh, with the things that they say they did. Um, the Iranians are sticking on a, on a demand that the US lift all of the sanctions at once. Um, and it is possible that we will concede that demand. They are claiming that they will then come into compliance immediately, which is a physical impossibility. Um, and we do have this little problem of physics that it takes time to downplan uranium. It takes time to dismantle centrifuge cascades. Uh, it takes time to do various of the things that the Iranians need to do, whereas sanctions can be lifted instantly. Um, so we, there's an inherent asymmetry here um, that the Iranians know perfectly well, um, but are trying to get over. So I think it's very likely that um, I, either all at once or in a series of tranches, sanctions relief will begin, and then the Iranians will come into compliance. Uh, the Iranians are additionally demanding that they, quote, verify that the sanctions have been lifted before they come into compliance. Um, that's a rather odd construct because sanctions are either present or they're not. And there's nothing really to verify unless they want to check the signature, um, you know, Biden's signature against his uh, some canonical signature. Um, but I think what they actually mean is that not only are the sanctions lifted, but that there is money coming in that had been blocked. If that is their standard, then there would be a very considerable delay between when the sanctions are lifted and when they come into compliance. And furthermore, um, I think they are going to try to demand that the Biden administration actively encourage, if not compel, industry to invest and, and follow through on various deals with them because their uh, argument is that the Trump administration's efforts to uh, prevent industry from doing that have made uh, industry too skittish and, and so forth. And there is, there is truth in that. Um, but they may be demanding that the, that the Biden administration actively lean into ensuring that there is foreign direct investment in Iran 
um, even before they come into compliance. We'll see what the Biden administration is actually prepared to give on that. Um, and Israel, I'll only say the Israelis are not going along with this. Um, Bibi gets no vote on whether or not we rejoin the deal or, or lift sanctions. He's not, the Israel isn't party to these agreements. Um, but it is apparent, and Danny can talk more to this, that the Israelis are taking a lot of action against the Iranian nuclear program. It's also apparent that that action is being talked about much more, including off the record by U.S. officials. And I'll put that out there and leave, uh, let Danny pick that up. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. Um, so one, uh, I think one additional interesting nuance uh, that, uh, in addition to what Fred's talking about, about the, uh, about the Biden administration's uh, attempt to ease back into the JCPOA, uh, I think there's no question that the Iranians perceive themselves in the driver's seat here. Uh, there is an eagerness on the part of the, uh, pardon me, administration that is, um, you know, as usual, just terrible signaling. I don't know. I don't know why it is that we persist in learning absolutely nothing about our our, our negotiating partners in this, but but we have. One of the most interesting things, though, is that China, which really played basically no role at all in the original negotiations of the JCPOA and actually um, was, let's say, moderately compliant with the sanctions that were placed on Iran under the Trump administration, it has always had this sort of hands-off approach. China is now playing a much more important role. And while I don't think that we know this to be sure, one of our scholars, um, our Jean Kirkpatrick fellow, Wang Jiwei, who spent 40 months in prison in Iran and uh, and speaks fluent Chinese uh, on top of his now very good Persian, um, believes that the administration has actually um, deliberately brought the Chinese into the negotiation and um, encouraged them. And that's why we saw, for example, the final inking of a uh, of a uh, investment agreement by China in Iran that all of us sort of scratched our head about because as Derek rightly said, it would have required China to invest more in Iran than invest in the United States. So this is sort of an additional piece that I think is very worth paying attention to. I think the administration is trying to leverage others to, um, to ease uh, Iran's financial pain in order to take the pressure off of us for lifting sanctions. So in addition, to to that data point on China, we also see the administration leaning on, for example, the Bank of Iraq to release frozen uh, uh, Iranian money. There's more than $4 billion in there, and uh, the Iranians really want it. They're leaning on the Iraqi government, and uh, and the Americans are not, uh, are not standing in the way. So again, what you're seeing is efforts to circumvent Congress, circumvent U.S. sanctions by going to others to ease Iran's pain. It's, um, to my mind, very naughty behavior. A last answer, an excellent question. Uh, totally right. Um, the, Fred is totally right. The Israelis are not going along, but I think the Israelis have gotten smarter. Um, and you know, this is always a, a, a spectrum. Uh, have gotten smarter uh, about their reactions. I think they recognize that jumping up and down and screaming about you know about our chief Iran negotiator not being a great guy or or about the administration having promised something else is going to serve them precisely this much zero. That's a big O. And um, and, uh, and at the same time, I think while they are expressing themselves very candidly to both the United States and all of the other players, they are pursuing a unilateral approach to, to um, Iran that uh, attempts to, is attempting to deal with the problem preemptively. And that's why we saw the very recent either cyber or physical, actually, Fred, I'd love to know what you think, uh, cyber or physical attack on the Natanz enrichment center that took a very substantial number of Iran's centrifuges offline. I don't think we have any doubt that Israel was behind that, in addition to the airstrikes that are going on in Syria. I think the Israelis are basically saying, you know, okay, well, you're not giving us a chance to say anything. We'll just try and say it in our way. So there it is. Whoops, Fred, I feel like we can't pass up the opportunity to hear your uh, reaction about Natanz. Um, I think it's, I think it's pretty clear that the, and I, there was, it, first of all, there was the Israelis. So I'm just going to say Israelis, even though I have no more proof that than, than you do. Um, I think it's pretty clear that the Israelis got an agent to move a table loaded with explosives into the facility, uh, which detonated and knocked out the power 
which in turn, if you turn power off on a, bunch, on a lot of centrifuges that are spinning as fast as they do, suddenly you wreck them. Um, and that that was the actual dynamic. But the story is, and, and I think the Iranians have more or less corroborated this, or at least put it out. The story is that it was a table full of explosives uh, that, that did that and they didn't check it because it looked, you know, looked like a table. So the next question is, uh, I think for all of us, which is, can you discuss the president's upcoming strategic security dialogue with Putin on June 15th after the G7 NATO summit? What do you think the administration is up to here with this risky strategy? And are they looking to use Russia to balance Beijing? I will take the first swing at it because I think that the Biden President Biden going so fast from tough talk about Vladimir Putin as a killer, which incidentally felt petulant and a lot more like Trump administration policy than the careful calibrated uh, view the Biden administration prefers to think of itself as. But it the transition to holding uh, a strategic dialogue with Vladimir Putin came in the midst of the Russian buildup of conventional forces and threat of an invasion of Ukraine. I read the decision to hold a summit with uh, Putin as the price the Biden administration chose to pay in the hopes of creating an off ramp for the for to protect Ukraine. But I would love to know what everybody else said, thinks and. Uh, Derek, I'd especially like to know what you think about the economics of a potential uh, Russia-China um, uh, deepening relationship, and also what you think about whether it's worthwhile economically to try and peel Russia away from such a relationship. I confess that anytime anyone says Russia, I stop listening. Um, not because Russia isn't important, it is important, but I have so much on my plate uh, that adding something really important overwhelms me. If you say, what about Paraguay? I'll be happy to try to address Paraguay. That doesn't really bother me too much. Um, look, you know, the, the Russian-Chinese economic relationship is uh, commodities. Um, the Chinese buy finance the, the production of uh, and buy Russian commodities. They use the Russians as commodity diversification away from the Middle East in, in energy, away from the Australians and to a lesser extent, the Brazilians in metals. Um, that's been standard Chinese strategy actually for a good 15 years, including before anyone was paying attention to it, because it didn't really matter around the world. Um, the Russians economically just don't mean anything. They're a commodity supplier, nobody cares. Um, so the, you know, I, the security side of this, I don't, I don't, I'm not knowledgeable about. The economic side of this, you wouldn't include Russia in any coalition to limit the Chinese in any way. It wouldn't It wouldn't work and it wouldn't matter. Um, so, sorry, maybe I misunderstood your question. Go ahead. No, that's exactly what I was hoping to elicit from you because there's so much talk about great power competition where great powers include China and Russia. And I think it's really important to narrow the aperture um, and point out that Russia actually isn't an economic power and therefore not a great power. It has nuclear weapons and it's played adroitly the gap between uh, what we say we care about and the risks we're actually willing to run. Think Obama administration and Syria. Um, we need to really think about the ways in which, in which Russia is a threat and what to do about it. Danny, I would love to know whether you think, if I'm right about the Biden administration uh, agreeing to uh, a strategic dialogue in order to uh, give Russia a sop and prevent the invasion of Ukraine, that feels a lot like what we did in the creation of the G8. Does it sound that way to you? You know, it does. First of all, yes, it does. It does sound that way to me. Uh, the problem, the problem, really is that it, it, somebody pointed out to me that that um, that you know Trump talked about this America first attitude 
Uh, and you know, for those of us who who studied history, we found that hugely offensive, uh, just because of the the derivations of the expression. But the reality is that the Biden team really seems to have an implicit America first approach. And what part of what that entails is never thinking about how the other side sees what you're doing. Never thinking about what their calculus is in this. You know, again, I I look at how the Russians have how the Russians have managed and I feel like in the case of both the Russians and the Chinese, they're managing us. We are playing on a field designated by them. And so we sort of play these, I I hesitate, but perhaps the right word is sophomoric tactical games with them in order to, you know, hey, look over here, you know, do this. This will be exciting for you. You Never understanding that, you know, they're like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll come to your house for a play date, you know, but I'm still going to come over tomorrow and beat the crap out of you. And, And that's, that's a strange naivete for a lot of very sophisticated people, but I think that it has become the default approach of the United States, which is to, which is is to is to, you know, have absolute disdain for how others are looking at the challenge. The next question, uh, I think I can answer drawing on things Derek and the rest of you have already said. The question is, what is the Biden administration doing to address the growing relationship between China and, and Iran? Is this partnership a real threat to our interests in the Middle East and Indo-Pacific? And I think the answer is the Biden administration is doing nothing to address the growing relationship between China and Iran. And in fact, their eagerness to get the JCPOA up and running again is facilitating uh, that relationship. Um, I'd be interested in others' views, particularly yours, Fred, about whether this partnership is a real threat to our interests in the Middle East and Indo-Pacific. It seems to me likely that it's an extension of Derek's uh, derision about Russia. That is, uh, China doesn't want a relationship with Iran. It wants commodity supplies from Iran um, and uh, is treating it like a gas station. But Fred, do you have a different view than that? Yes and no. I think it's very easy to to hyperventilate about the Rus- the, the Chinese Iranian relationship, or, or about the Russian Iranian uh, Russian Chinese relationship, for that matter. Um, but the Chinese do want more uh, from Iran uh, than that. I think the Chinese are have are have been and continue to be establishing a network of military bases um, into the Middle East and uh, Africa. Um, which should be very concerning for us as they are also engaged in a massive military buildup that includes expeditionary capabilities. Um, and this goes to a point, uh, you know, one of our colleagues, Paul Wolfowitz, makes all the time that we continue to talk about uh, a China strategy that pretends that the only theater in which we can or should deal with China is the Taiwan Strait or maybe the South China Sea uh, without recognizing that the Middle East in general, not just Iran, is incredibly vitally important to the Chinese. They see it that way. And they are working hard to establish not just an economic presence, but also a military presence at the moment when we are talking about pulling out and leaving the region so that we can focus on China. Um, So there's a bit of a disconnect there. Um, The Chinese are not gonna invest gazillions of dollars in Iran, um, as as Derek uh, rightly says, That's that's a laugh line. Um, And I think the Iranians know that. Um, But the Chinese are buying more Iranian oil. That is a fact. Um, And the Iranians are up over a million barrels a day and no sanctions have been formally lifted. Um, This goes to Danny's point, which I really want to double down on. Um, This is not the world of 2017. This is not the world of 2015 when the JCPOA was signed and came into effect. China is a much more active player here. And what I think China sees in Iran in part is a place where they can mess with us, a place where they can hurt us outside of Asia. And we won't do anything about it. But there's one other thing, going back to Danny's point on human rights, which is very important. What we do know, and we'll have a terrific paper from our uh, Iran analyst, Nick Carl, coming out um, soon that lays this out, 
is that the Chinese are selling the Iranians the te technology of oppression that they have been using in Hong Kong and against their own population. And the Iranians are going to deploy that. That's going to raise some interesting sanctions. Be, uh, I'm sorry, some interesting questions because some I'm willing to bet you that some of that technology is going to be supporting sanctioned entities in Iran. And the question of what we then do to the Chinese companies that are selling tools of oppression to sanctioned entities in Iran, sanctioned for human rights issues, not for nuclear issues, is going to be something the Biden administration is going to have to deal with. And I, I don't want to prejudge, but what based on what they've done so far, I'm guessing that they won't do anything about it. But it will be yet another major test of their seriousness about any kind of commitment to human rights. Excellent. Colin, the next uh, question is for you. In his speech, President Biden touted a foreign policy that will win the 21st century. What should this policy look like? Well, I, you know, the Biden team doesn't ask me for advice. <laughs> but um, I would say that what struck me about Biden's State of the Union address was that uh, it was almost entirely about domestic priorities. And this is something that's come up on this panel. And I went back and looked at it, and it it was overwhelmingly about the argument that you need to reground American strength in domestic strength, uh, and that's fine as far as it goes. But uh, this is another convergence versus divergence, right, with their approach, which is on the one hand you have this incredibly ambitious domestic agenda, I mean colossal trillion dollar bills, two trillion, three trillion, one after the other, right? So that's a whole other debate, but. Um, when you're racking up this kind of debt, when this is your priority in terms of time, energy, expense, political capital, it's going to affect your foreign policy. And it's going to affect your defense policy. And I think a number of you are, have already pointed out, it's going to impact defense spending. They've made it very clear. It's a shift from guns to butter, to put it simply. So you know, defense is going to be flat or even cut. At the same time, what they're not doing is closing the gap between capabilities and commitments. If anything, they've laid out a more ambitious set of goals, vague though they are, on foreign policy. It, nothing less than you know, restoring what's called rules-based liberal world order. So there's a lot of statements of concern all over the world. We, we know they're concerned about a lot of things. Uh, we know they want to restore liberal order, whatever exactly that means. But they're not going to back it up with action in a lot of cases. Um, and as a matter of fact, they seem to be cutting defense. So this is a persistent problem in the history of U.S. foreign policy. I think it's especially true on uh, the left side of the aisle, to tell you the truth. And, you know, the president needs to make it a priority to close those gaps. If it's not a presidential priority, it won't happen. There are some good people in there who take seriously, for example, the challenge on China, but they're not actually in charge. So President Biden made it very clear last night that his priority is domestic. It's not international. Unfortunately, you may not care about geopolitics, but geopolitics care about you. I mean, the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians, the Taliban, the North Koreans will take advantage of whatever gaps exist. And I'm afraid, I hope this doesn't happen, I'm afraid that we can stumble into conflict with one or more of these actors, maybe even at the same time, because out of the best of intentions, President Biden is not ensuring a, a, a firm line that would actually deter potential aggressors. Can I, Corey, can I add a little bit to that? Please. Uh, this will be brief because it's always about the future and no one cares about the fact that we're undermining the dollar. The single biggest tool of U.S. power in the world is the dollar as reserve currency, and it's not close. And if I took it away, I would explain, I could explain, we could have a long seminar why I explain what the hell happens, which is when the world degenerates into blocks, wars break out, the whole business. We're, the Biden administration isn't undermining the dollar in 2022 or 2023. That's not the way this works. But it is increasing the probability of a medium term end to the dollar as the globally accepted currency. And I am not defending the Trump administration on this. They sucked. You know, don't get me wrong. But this is like the Democrats saying, well, you sucked and we're going to do even worse. We accept this challenge. So the Republicans open the door for borrowing for no good reason. And the Democrats are like, thank you very much. Uh, me and all my friends are walking through this door. And we're not going to see the consequences for this internationally into the, in the next couple of years, but we will see them. And they, when, they get, when we get to that point, and this is the problem with currency, once we get to the point that the dollar starts losing its status, it's too late. We can't solve it. We can't fix it. 
Uh, and we hear the Biden people talk about this on climate change, but they're doing exactly the opposite on finance. So, you know, to add, I agree with what Colin said, but just to add to it, he's actually understating the problem. We have an immediate problem of capabilities versus uh, commitment. We have a long-term problem that we're eroding the system that they claim that they are trying to strengthen. And I would add that the principal reliance on sanctions as the major tool of American foreign policy also accelerates the longer term challenge of the dollar as a holding currency. As you see the Chinese try and create a petro yuan, as you see European countries band together to try and skirt Iran sanctions, we, we need to give some thought to policies that are more than sanctions um, and as we address these things. So the next question is, has Biden projected enough American strength to deter our adversaries? Uh, I will uh, answer that one on our behalf, which is no, um, right? No, just no, because deterrence requires both um, a belief on the part of your adversary, to Danny's point that we're not thinking about our adversary's perspective, it requires a belief on the part of your adversary that you have both the ability to defend your interests and a willingness to do so. And on both of these, with the cuts to defense spending, with the prioritization in the Department of Defense on a lot of social um, issues rather than an emphasis on the focusing on fighting and winning the nation's wars. I'm not saying social issues aren't important. I'm saying they're not the only thing that's important and they're not the main reason we recruit, train and equip a military force. Moreover, um, the uh, withdrawal of from Afghanistan certainly sends a message to America's adversaries that you can just wind down the clock on the United States, that we don't care enough about our own interests to defend them. And that's where the gap between the administration's rhetoric, like that we would uh, defend Taiwan against Chinese military aggression, and an unwillingness on the part of the administration to either fund what is necessary to carry out their policies, and also to prepare the American public for those enormous undertakings by spending political capital on national security policy as a serious component of what you're doing, not as something that we will do uh, once we get our domestic uh, you know, bodybuilding underway. It really matters um, that we actually convey both the willingness and the ability to protect our interests. The next to last question, the penultimate question, um, is about gray zone warfare. And Fred, I think I will direct this first to you. Um, uh, the, I'm not, none of us are really cyber experts, but the question asks, did the Biden administration proportionally respond to the solar winds attack? What can the US do to address the rise of non-state actors using cyber warfare to achieve their aims? I'll take a first cut at it, which is to say, um, getting really good at cyber warfare is one thing we can and should do. And I actually think the increases in NSA's capability and the enabling of those capabilities by uh, congressional legislation and congressional funding are really important. Um, but a lot of cyber, is actually about sharing information with the private sector, getting information with the private sector. And there, I think the Biden administration being more open, but maybe even more importantly, American companies being more open. And we have seen a little bit of that recently that I don't think is uh, so much a change of administration as it is all of us are getting smarter about what we need to do to build the commercial, social, and governmental resilience on this. But Fred, do you have a different view? No, Corey. I'm, I think that you're. I think that you're. You're right, and I would take it further. Um, 
the root of our difficulty in defending against cyber attack in the first instance is the traitor Edward Snowden. Um, and we need to take that head on. Snowden told, in addition to being a traitor and uh, releasing a lot of classified information that unquestionably helped our enemies, um, Snowden destroyed any kind of trust the American people had in their government's uh, activities in cyberspace through a series of lies. Snowden persuaded the American people that the government was spying on us all all the time, which was simply untrue. In part as a result of that, a lot of people working in the IT space are absolutely unwilling to work with the government. And so we have American companies like Google, so, which pay, which make a fortune in the United States from the American market, refusing to do business with the United States government and refusing to supply the American military with anything other than what it can buy like any other consumer. This is a huge problem, but it goes deeper than that. If, the, if you want the government to assist in defending against cyber attack, the government has to be on your network, frankly. The attacks happen at network speed. The response has to occur at network speed. You can't be in a situation where the government has no connection with your network to begin with. The attack occurs and then you call up somebody and say, we're being attacked. It's over by that point. But in order for that to work, and there are ways to make this work technically without compromising privacy. But in order for that to work, we have to rebuild a basis of trust between industry and the workers in the IT industry and the government. And unfortunately, I see the country generally heading, of course, in the opposite direction in terms of losing trust in government. As long as that's the case, the government is not going to be able to protect the economy, which leaves us in this area with an issue of cyber offensive response, if you're going to be uh, take meaningful action. But that's very problematic in a couple of ways, and I won't get too technical here, but there is a problem that most of the time, if you use a cyber offensive weapon against an adversary, you're also giving the adversary that weapon, and they can then turn it back against you. And given that we're looking at adversaries where the governments do protect their internets, do protect uh, all of their uh, private citizens from us anyway, not from them, um, giving them those weapons creates vulnerabilities. So we're, we're, we've created an enormous problem, or, we, or Snowden has created an enormous problem for us, but no administration subsequent to him has taken that core problem on. And I, until we do, I, just, I, I don't think that we're going to be able to, to respond well to this challenge. Um, we have time for one more question, and there's a great one that I think I'd like everybody to, to give their perspective on, which is, what are the chances that the Biden administration, so focused now on domestic issues, will find itself defined by a foreign policy crisis? And I want to add, uh, put a little topspin on the ball for you big swing and hitters um, by asking you, where you think, what you think a foreign policy crisis might be. So which of the pots do you believe likeliest to boil over and produce a foreign policy crisis? Uh, Danny, let's start with you. Thank you. Um, what, a, what a fun question. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to ruin it for everybody else because there's so, so much low hanging fruit here. Uh, but I think the big question for, for the Biden administration isn't uh, which which problem will boil over and cause uh, the the administration to be defined by foreign policy. I think it's, you know, which won't, because we've got so many roiling problems and we have not had a president in the last 50 years, and I'm probably trimming a little too much off here, who has not used some version of it's time for nation building here at home, right? It's the economy stupid and has not nonetheless been defined by some foreign policy crisis, whether it was the Suez or, you know, or, 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 um, or Al Qaeda, or I mean, we could go Saddam Hussein, you know, and they're not all in the Middle East. We've got, you know, the South China Sea, we've got, we've got so much going on and, 
we are paying so little attention to it. And as all of my colleagues said, spending so little to brace ourselves to both deter or counter these guys that I I believe that it would be will be only luck that gets Joe Biden through four years without a national security crisis. Thank you, Danny. Fred, you're up next. Thanks, Danny. I, I agree with that. Um, look, the world is on fire. The world is on fire. War. There is an arc of war throughout the entire Middle East from Lebanon through Syria, through Iraq, down to Yemen. And there are Americans involved in that war and there are enormous American interests at stake in that war. NATO ally Turkey is involved in that war. And the Russians are involved in that war. Africa is on fire. I won't even list all the wars that are going on in Africa. And I say Africa and most people probably fall asleep because that's what normally happens. Here's the problem. The largest concentration of Salafi jihadi terrorist groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS anywhere in the world is in Africa. And we are vir doing virtually nothing about it. That will bite us. The odds of a, a jihadi attack on the United States in the Biden first term are high. It's not certain, but they're high. The odds of an attack on us on our remaining positions in the Middle East, including embassies, even if we pulled all our military out, are high. The odds that the Russians will absorb one or more of their neighbors in the Biden term a, a, approach 100 percent. May not be NATO states, but it could be high. I'm not a China expert. I can't speak to that. People who are say we need to take very seriously the possibility that there will be a war with China in five years. We're not. So we, we have to internalize the reality that the strategic pause is over. And great power competition, Corey, I can argue with you about whether Russia is a great power. It might just be me as a Russian historian rebelling against the notion that it isn't. But it's enough of a power to pose a huge problem to us, nuclear, conventional, and unconventional military, and we are not postured to deal with it. So I don't know what problem is going to be, but I think, as I agree with Danny, if we do not find ourselves under attack and in a war, sometime during this administration, I will be very surprised and delighted to be wrong. Okay, Derek Scissors. Um, I'll stick to China uh, since that's about the only area I can come up with a security answer. Here's the, here's the story with China. In 2022, there's gonna be a Communist Party Congress, which is going to proclaim that Xi Jinping is the greatest leader in the history of the universe, while everyone cowers and says that I praise my, my, my big daddy enough, uh, or am I gonna disappear? Um, he's, you know, previous Chinese leaders have left, at, the last couple of Chinese leaders have left voluntarily after 10 years. This is his 10 year mark. He is not leaving. He's like trying to decide if he can become a vampire, live forever and rule China for a thousand years to come. If his position is weaker than he wants, and you know, I mean weak, I don't mean like a tiny little bit weak, weak but, but weaker, it's very hard to evaluate from the outside. Um, there are obvious problems in China economically. There were problems with COVID, uh, but his his predecessor was was ineffective. So it's hard to know how weak his position is. But if it's weaker, that's when we have the serious China problem. So China is more of a of a we don't know, but it's kind of an on off switch. If he's fine, he's not going to cause trouble around the Congress because he's it's a it's a deification of him. If he's not fine, that's when Taiwan, South China Sea, India, Vietnam you know, the Korean Peninsula, whatever it is, those issues spike because he tries to draw attention to those issues and say, I'm the only one that can protect China from these terrible threats from the outside. So I wouldn't, I don't know whether to call it likely. I would say we have an on off switch for, with the Chinese and, and the switch is gonna get flipped in about the next year. Three very bracing predictions. Colin Duick, you get the last word, my friend. Thanks, Corey. Uh, well, it's happened repeatedly in American history that the U.S. goes to war because some adversary thinks that it can get away with it and that the U.S. will not fight. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the U.S. often does fight. Uh, we just fight in cases where we haven't made it clear beforehand that we will. So uh, one way to solve that would be to uh, pull up the drawbridge and say that we're not going to do anything at all. Another way that I would recommend is to make it clear that we actually mean what we say. And so 
that's my concern, is if you look at these hot spots, I'm not sure that President Biden's really doing that. I think it's entirely possible that he will stumble into a crisis or even an armed conflict for that exact reason, because of a breakdown of deterrence. And he wouldn't be the first one. I mean, this again, it's happened to both parties over the generations. Of all the cases that I worry about the most, I would say Taiwan, just because the Chinese have built up their capabilities in such an impressive way. I'm not sure, as though we've increased awareness of the problem, we are very far from solving the problem. So Taiwan's the case that I probably worry about the most. I would like to thank you four excellent scholars from the American Enterprises Institute's foreign and defense policy team for this excellent education and for the privilege for, of being among you. And I'd like to thank everybody who participated and gave us those fantastic questions. Thank you very much.